All right, man. Well, you know, just some background so people know, we actually got to meet in person uh, for one podcast has been out, but the second half, which I consider to be the better half of that podcast, is not out yet. But now that I have found some software to help me get things out quicker, uh, I feel like that podcast is going to come out because it's four person podcast. And so uh, people haven't seen the that aspect of you yet. But uh, I just want to give some background that we've actually met and we had a lot of conversations. So um, from my understanding and what we've talked about, you've been into jujitsu. Yeah. Yes, uh, started training in 2009 and took me a long time to get my blue belt. Well, not so long to get my blue belt. It took me a few years, but it took me a really long time to get my purple belt. So usually it takes a few years and uh, it took me, I got my blue belt in 2012 and from there to um, 2021, I think is when I got my purple. So yeah, been training the old gentle art that's not always so gentle because you're trying to choke people unconscious. <laughs> You know, I've the only things I really know about jujitsu. I've never practiced. I don't know. I'm so I'm a pretty much a complete noob, and I like to admit that just so you know where I'm coming from. So all I know about it is when I watch. I I think UFC is interesting, so I, yeah. I like to tune in for the big fights sometimes, just to see athletes at their ultimate potential of voluntarily doing things like that. If it wasn't, it was involuntary. It'd be a different story, right? But it's like yeah. they're getting paid. They want. They're saying, "I want to do this." Okay, great. So that's how morally I'm not against it because it's like, well, they want to. Yeah, so, they signed up for this. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> but with that, how, how could you explain like jujitsu? Just explain the concept of it to me. Just sure. like a, just like a little kid or something. Yeah. I mean, I have a lot of ideas on why jujitsu is valuable and aside from just being self, a self-defense art, but we'll focus in on that portion. Um, so rewind back to 1993, I believe, when the UFC first got started. UFC 1. Hoist Gracie, I'm sure you've heard the name Hoist Gracie. This guy comes out. He looks like he's in a bathrobe, and he's fighting these monsters, these big muscular guys. And all of a sudden, he's joint locking them, choking them unconscious. And everybody was like, what is this? What is this art? And jujitsu was an art that is really a, an offshoot of judo. So... Brazilian jiu-jitsu is how most people understand it, but it was brought to Brazil back in the early 1900s, and there was a guy by the name of Elio Gracie who was, for lack of a better term, frail. Like He was just a smaller guy. He had been sick since he was a kid. So he started, he, he always, like there was a big fight culture. There was something called Luda Livre, which was more like what we see modern MMA now. And for him, he struggled to fight against these guys who are massive so they started focusing in on the leverage like being able to utilize an opponent's strength against them and focus on the leverage so that a smaller weaker opponent could actually dominate someone who was much larger and stronger than them so that's why i think jujitsu is so valuable because anybody can pick it up and anybody can learn it it is complex but it's not if you were to go and take boxing or kickboxing you can't spar at 100% because you got guys, women and guys, just knocking your block off. I mean, they're, even if you're sparring at 80%, you're just going to be taking these blows to the head and you're going to end up with CTE. With jiu-jitsu, you can spar at pretty near 100% and still go to work the next day. And uh, someone who, myself, when I first started jiu-jitsu, that was why I fell in love with it because I was never a physically imposing guy. And my uncle actually started training my brother. Who is, I mean, he's like six foot three, muscular, like natural athlete. I have none of those qualities. Um, and so I was like, I can't let my little brother, my younger brother, beat my ass. I've got to learn this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so I started training and uh, just fell in love with how it's like human chess. So, from a, per from a um, self defense standpoint, it is a great way to be able to control a larger opponent. It is a great way to be able to protect yourself so that even if you don't win a fight in a real life confrontation and you need to protect yourself, at least you know how to keep yourself from getting really harmed. Um, so from that standpoint, that is the value of jujitsu as a self-defense art. Hmm. Okay. So from there, what are the different levels of jujitsu? Cause you say in belts, I don't know. Right. I'm assuming from karate. There's belts, yeah. but I, yeah, how, but how does it, is it the dog. same system? 
Cobra Kai shirt here. Um, yeah, it's different. So in, in karate, you have belts. I'm not sure what all the belts are, but there are more. In jiu-jitsu, there's white belt, which is obviously a universally known beginner. Um, then there's blue belt. And at blue belt, you are starting to really understand some of the techniques. And then at purple belt, um, you're beginning to be able to put those techniques together into your own game plan. And then you're refining them into to brown belt and black belt. There's a really good analogy that I heard a long time ago where it was like um, white belt, you are learning the letters. And at blue belt, you're putting those letters into words. And then at purple belt, you're learning to create sentences. And then at brown belt, paragraphs and black belt, you're having a conversation with someone. And that's kind of how I view jujitsu. It's especially since I've been doing it for 14 years, I don't go in there thinking, oh, I want to win. I want to submit somebody. I, I don't care about that so much. Sometimes it's fun. But <laughs> yeah, I want to go in there and I want to have right? a conversation with someone. What's that? If you're competing. Right? If you're competing, right. Yeah, if you're competing, your goal is obviously to win. Um, but, you know, if you're just training with your friends, like for sure it is fun to talk shit, tap somebody out here and there. But ultimately I go in there with the idea that I want to have fun and I want to flow. And I, I like training with someone who is a higher belt level because you're able to have that conversation with your body essentially. It's a kind of an intimate thing. So it's basically the, would you say it is the physical chest out of anything in life? Yeah, very much so. Um, it's, it's definitely human chess. And, uh, it also, there's a really good analogy that my professor told me a long time ago, which, um, He's he's great at analogies, but, uh, he was saying that, you know, when life gets you, when you're being pressed down in life, when you're really being smothered and you're being like, you feel like you have all this weight on you. If you can just make a little bit of space and you can just get enough space to breathe and you can start working practical things that, you know, make your life better, you're able to escape or, uh, reverse position or come out on top. And that's kind of the analogy of jujitsu to life. One of the more philosophical ways to look at jujitsu. And it also is just when you go into jujitsu and you have somebody who's way bigger than you and, um, way stronger and they're able to do, you know, dominate you or really just press you down into the mat, you come out on the other side, you're like, wow, I actually survived that. And then it gives you a confidence. That's really more than anything, I think what jujitsu has given me is this confidence, not only to know I could protect myself if I needed to, but just like if I can endure that, what's this like me being upset about some bullshit over here? That's nothing comparatively, <laughs> you know? That was my next question for you is, do you feel like it benefits you uh, psychologically yeah. in life? Yeah, I notice a yeah. difference when I'm training and when I'm like, like uh, when I got back from Virginia, you know, I was really inspired by meeting you guys and um, uh, really thinking about content. You know, we talked a lot about creating videos and just like having fun with it and, and finding the thing that drives us. And I came back and I was, um, inspired by really inspired by how, uh, Bruno did his, um, did some of his, uh, green screen videos and so, and Marco as yeah. well. And like, I was like, oh, let me fuck around with that because I hadn't done a whole lot of those. And it was cool because you can change the images and all of that. But then right after, I, I like made a few videos and I haven't made as many since. But I focused on jujitsu because um, – so my dad died last June and he – 58 years old, not really that old. So I'm like, damn. Like, And then my grandpa died in his 60s and I'm like, all right. I'm a little overweight and um, although I work out a lot, my diet's obviously not the best. So I need to really focus in on this and um, started counting, like tracking everything I eat and doing jujitsu four or five times a week. And now over the past couple of weeks, I've only been going about once or twice. And I, I notice a massive difference in my, in just like how I walk through the day. I don't feel quite as good. It does make a difference. And yeah. I agree with you. I did also walk away from Virginia with a, a new found sense of inspiration. And it's kind of ironic because that was, when did we go there? January? Was that yeah, January? it was mid January, I guess. Yeah. So but now months later, like four or three months, something like that. I feel like I finally figured it out <laughs> and it took that long. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you, you finally, think, what do you feel like you finally figured out? Like what, uh, like your approach I've, to, I know we had a couple yeah. conversations about you thinking about this differently. 
Yeah. I figured out how to satisfy all of what I want to be doing because mm. there's been the yeah. sense that I want to do more uh, because mm. I felt like with short form, I didn't just want to be the guy on Instagram who made these like cool videos. Yay. I wanted to be like, what is that next level? And I felt like I did my content wasn't my content was a representation of more who I had been in the past versus who yeah. I'm moving into being. And here's the biggest thing that I took away from these last couple months. And really I had my own journey with my body and, and, and you, for you, what jujitsu does for you, there's a system called functional patterns that uh, I've been doing. That's a, it's a type of functional training uh, that involves a lot of getting your body correctly moving through space with walking, sitting, uh, standing, throwing, running, you know, basic human movements and using resistance, but, you know, just basically a different style combined with diet. And what you're saying is like that provided you a level of confidence. And I feel like that's the same for me. For me, it's in what I eat and then what I'm doing with my body. Am I taking care of it? Because I've been making content for years, but I don't feel this confident. And it brought me back to my roots in kinesiology where I, that's what I went to college for. And yeah. I was really wanted to do bodybuilding at that point. And yeah. how much I enjoyed that I before that I found too. out everyone was on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> right? Dude, I, I actually have, uh, let me grab it and show it to you. This, I, this was like one of my first intros to weightlifting is the uh, Arnold's encyclopedia of modern bodybuilding. I found this at a thrift store back in like 2000. One yeah, or something. I, I was like, oh, I'm going yeah, to be as big as Arnold. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Turns out there's more than just diet and lifting weights. No shade on those guys because they still work very hard. But yeah, it's not It's not what you think it is. Right. It, that's what I found out too. So I kind of like moved away from that into like the spiritual stuff. And then I came back recently and realized how important it is because mm. people think that you need to go hard at the expense of your health. But I found for me, maintaining health through movement and what I eat is the, th the foundation of the house that allows me to feel confident enough and feel good enough in my body to actually reach my potential. Like right now, like before we filmed this today, um, I was actually recording a skit and then when I'm done, I'll record the rest of the skit and then I'll edit the skit and I'll go to bed and then I'll edit this podcast and then I'll do another skit. And it's just like, I couldn't do that if my diet wasn't right. And yeah. if I There's didn't feel good in my body, if I have aches and, you know, there's a lot more to it. So yeah, I, I think I've realized myself how important movement is. And I've been interested in doing jujitsu myself and doing some sort of martial art. And I was curious about, well, do I start boxing? Do I start doing mm -hmm. jujitsu? Because, you know, I heard Jocko Willink. You know who that yeah. is? Yes. Okay. So him talking about how if you're going to get into a fight, if it's a boxing fight, you can just run away if you want to protect yourself. <laughs> and <Right. laughs> if you can't run away, then they're going to be close enough to where you can grapple them. Mm -hmm. And like they're already grabbing you and then you can win. So that's why he recommended jujitsu. And I'm like, that's interesting. You know? Yeah, I think it's good to have that? both. Uh, but any, you know, sometimes people will ask, what is the best martial art? And I always say it's the one you stick with. It's the same kind of advice that people ask about what's the best workout routine. It's the one you're going to actually do. Uh, obviously, I have a preference for jujitsu, but uh, any kind of martial art is really good, even just like spiritually. You know, you get kind of the same thing from the other martial arts as well. But I think if you wanted to be able, you know, a complete fighter uh, or be able to completely defend yourself, you would need some grappling art and be at least have some basic understanding of how to throw a punch. It's it's fascinating to me to watch like officer these these videos of cops who get in these situations where they're trying to control someone and they have no idea what they're doing and I'm like this is crazy you you should be training some I mean, you, your job is to protect yourself and to protect the, I guess to, you know like make sure you don't fuck the person up too bad that you're trying to apprehend and they don't really train they only get like one like one hour of what they call combatives a year and I'm thinking you're going out there every day doing an incredibly difficult job and you're not training, you're not learning how to do it. So yeah, that was just an aside. It's just kind of interesting like how a lot, and then a lot of people think there's a meme 
and a joke that kind of goes around the martial arts community where there's these guys that are like, oh, you don't know me, bro. My mentality, when I see red, bodies just start dropping. And it's like, that's, yeah, you think, you see red, you see black, you black out because you close your eyes and you just start swinging, you know, like, you really should train if you, um, you know, want to be able to protect yourself. Yeah, I think it's a, it's important as men. I mean, what, what role do you think, like, there's a lot of talk about men nowadays and what, what makes a man and what kind of embodied man looks like. How do you... How do you see that? What do you think the role of a man is in society and in, in the world in general? Yeah, I mean, I think I can really speak only speak to m how I view my role as a man. And uh, obviously, I, th I, you know, uh, I tend to think that how I view what my role as a man is should be how other men view it as well. But I, I imagine people have different thoughts on that. I definitely think there is some truth to the idea that, of men being um, protectors, you know, like I definitely, I have four kids and, and a wife and I definitely think like my role, my number one role is to keep them safe, protect and provide. But you know, like there is definitely, um, uh, you know, the Chris, the Chris Rock joke. I don't know if you ever heard it where he, he's saying, basically the only people that experience unconditional love are children and dogs. Like a lot of times, sometimes a lot of times, sometimes men are expected to just be that to just be the provider and the protector. And I do think there is, um, you know, the emp empathic side of what makes a complete man. Cause you're not just, your role isn't just to be this robot that's protective and providing. You also have to have this emotional side to you. So communicating with my kids is, is super important. And like, I, I probably over communicate. Like I share some things with, I have a 14 year old, and I share some things with them sometimes about like my mistakes and about my experiences. And sometimes I'm like, should I have even told him that's a little, little too much? Cause you know, like some things are kind of fucked up about this world, but mm -hmm. I, he has a really good perspective on things. And I think part of that is because I've never, I never like coddled him and thought like, Oh, he's, I shouldn't tell him about that. Let's protect him in this little bubble. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of complex. I think, uh, yeah, I'd be interested to hear what, what you think about the role of men. I agree with you. I, I do think that just because of biology, it makes sense that men are their protectors mm -hmm. just based on the fact that they're bigger most of the time and um, ha can do higher level physical things. I mean, this is why men fight wars, right? Yeah. And so I do think that there is that side. I think that there's basically extremes on both ends. People think that men mm -hmm. should be super stoic and to the point where they should always be hard. And that was my grandpa. And it was just like, he just turned into a bitter, bitter yeah. man because he didn't felt like he couldn't open up at all. You know, he was a war veteran. And I think it almost, life was so hard for him and he had such a hard view because of it and society were, uh, didn't necessarily condone compassion for men in that way during that time period. Cause this was early on, you know, he's gone, he's been gone since 2001 or something like that or before, mm -hmm. but it just, it made me think about how for men, there still needs to be a level of compassion. And uh, I think that, the, if men have compassion, this is what changes the world. And it's not by having a blind compassion or a pacifist compassion. It's by having a, some people might even call it a spiritual connection or, mm -hmm. you know, a connection to the empathetic side. Because why do we fight wars and why do we, you know, have huge problems in the world? A lot of times because there is no empathy. And... Sure. Where what is the root of evil? You know, there is always going to be some sort of evil, but I think that finding a balance between we don't want men to be so feminine that they're not able to defend anything, they're just ruled over, and not so masculine that they're bitter and just want to fight everything. Somewhere in the middle, right? Right. That's, yeah, tapping that's into the masculine and feminine energy. Which is, yeah. you know, I think everybody sees it. That's where maybe some of the conversation about these topics are difficult for people because everybody has different definitions of what these terms mean. So it might be helpful for some people to define the terms before 
they begin the conversation because masculinity to some people means like the toxic bro Chad guy to some people like to me, it means like, uh, doing what I say I'm going to do and showing up for myself and my family and, um, being, uh, representative of, of how my, you know, representing my highest self, like that's what I view masculinity as, but also those could be traits of a woman as well. So yeah, I mean, it's, uh, but the problem too about defining things before you have a conversation is that's not really a good way to have a flowy conversation. You know, like if you're, you're just like, how do I ask you, let's define the terms before we talk. And then we can talk under these pretenses. It's just kind of a weird thing to do. Because then it becomes everybody's defense. It almost, you have a defense mechanism of debate. I feel like yeah. then it becomes more a debate, but yeah. sometimes it depends on who you're talking to, how hostile the person is to. Mm -hmm. And I True. think it's healthy that we talk about things like this. And I think it is also healthy to define masculinity and feminine aspects as well. For me, how I look at it is masculine traits might be more like, let's think about practically because, you know, you can define masculine as anything these days. That's what it seems like. People just want to, you know, do that. And so I think about it practically, like if masculinity had to be defined, it would probably be something like the biological male uh, pros. Mm -hmm. And you would have things that females are specifically, what we can see historically, at least, they are more in tune with. So you could say, that historically, just maybe even because of men being bigger and sh stronger, that men are be, be again protectors, and then then you could say masculinity could be things having to do with physicality and effort, because protection takes effort. And then you could say the yin or yin yang. Mm -hmm. You could say the yin or the feminine could be more about. Uh, compassion, maybe empathy, uh, caring, caregivers, providing. Um, and how you can think about that historically is the masculine would bring in the food, hunt the food, bring the food, and then the women would cut the, cook the food. So that, that's what I mean by caregiving. It's like yeah. taking care of the materials. The men get the materials, and the women take care of the materials. So if we have a balance then we can kind of have both of that in ourselves yeah. and we don't necessarily have to be too much because again, when you get too masculine, then you're all, cause what's the extreme then? Cause then you have like this spectrum of masculinity. The extreme end of that would be that you are wanting to provide so much and you become greedy that you want to take away from other people when you don't yeah. need that, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I'm not saying that's every man, but no, for sure. And, I think also the way that people present it as if one is preferable to the other, sometimes it's either, or maybe, and maybe it's the way it's received by some people. They think that people are saying that I, obviously I prefer to embody myself mass as masculine. Uh, but like people think that you're, that this, these concepts or these traits of nurturing and compassion and care are somehow inferior to the masculine, but you really, you really need both. You need, both sides, it's like the old political argument, you kind of need a conservative and a liberal, you need masculine and feminine, you need, you know, you need both ends of a spectrum, you need freedom. And you need control, you know, so it's like everything exists on a on a spectrum. And it's that old Buddhist, I guess, thought of the middle path, finding the middle path, or balance or whatever infinite role of words you want to find to express that concept of like, this middle way where you're pulling from both ends and just finding what works best for you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious. It's going to be a random question, but right. are you into gardening? <laughs> Am I into gardening? You know, I actually used to work at a company called park seed that they were one of the first companies to send seeds into space in the seventies. And I worked at Park Seed. I was helping distribute wholesale seeds and plants and all this stuff. Uh, at that time, I was very much into gardening. I absolutely loved gardening. And I still do. Nice. I just haven't done it in a while. 
Yeah, I feel like I that's something he always just we're th- we're talking about freedom and stuff. I'm thinking about why does everybody have grass, bro? Like why? <laughs> why do we have lawns? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not the guy that cares that much about what my lawn looks like, you know. I always thought that was a little yeah. weird. <laughs> it's like we could put food there and all grow it mm-hmm. and Yeah, know. it is weird. I was reading something a while back that it was like I don't remember what it was. It was some there was some reason that they had for it where it was maybe it was a conspiracy where they were trying to keep people from growing their own food, you know, so that we can go and buy toxic shit from the grocery store. Go buy fake meats and all that stuff. What? You don't like fake meat? I, I've never tried it. I would imagine it's terrible. Have. You have? Is it good? I used to be vegan for two years, so absolutely. Oh, you told me that. Yeah, I remember that. So <laughs> was it was it like close to it at all? Yeah. Yeah. It was close in the taste, yeah. The, yeah. the Beyond Meat, I didn't know how terrible it was for you at that point. Right. I mean, now yeah, I they were marketing now as a health alternative. Yeah. And... um so for me now, I'm like, I'm not going to have it again, but it does, it does resemble mm-hmm. what the taste of meat is, but it just blows my mind that people aren't just like, let me get this. I'm na- I'm, I'm a vegan to be natural, but let me get this unnatural stuff. Right. Un- yeah. Natural. Why were, <laughs> so were you a vegan for health issues or like reasons, or was it like, because you didn't want to eat animal like to kill animals? Or a little bit of both. There's a little bit of morality in there because I was mm. under the delusion that morally, that's a whole conversation about why morally. I mean, obviously there's extremists in factory farming, and obviously that's a big no. But mm. um, you're going to kill something no matter what. And so yeah. I was at that point under the delusion that it was ethically better. And that's just my opinion. Of course, there's going to be people that disagree, and I'm not trying to tell everybody they should eat the same way as me. But this is just my yeah. experience in it. Maybe that was harsh. But I, that's what I that's what I thought at that point, where it was better to. And then I, the more the bigger reason, the biggest reason was that I thought it was more spiritual to not. Mm. And I didn't really understand because there's a lot of dogma out there about that that you need to have, eat a certain way. But then I stumbled across this guy named Dr. Hawkins, who was a gentleman who had supposedly reached an enlightened state and i know people that were in his presence and could feel it and they got spontaneously healed for, like personally I've, I've met these people and they got spontaneously healed in the presence of him and there's that's been said about many masters is that you go in their presence and when you're in their presence you can literally feel the energy and so with that reference and studying his work it made me realize that this guy was eating chicken nuggets and pizza and it did not matter <laughs> what he was eating. And he, he, he said that too. It's like, I think he said something along the lines of you could live longer, but it doesn't affect your spirituality. And that's not an exact quote. And I, that could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that he was talking about how it's not your de- spirituality isn't determined by necessarily what you eat, but there are, you know, yeah. typically fasting, Abstaining from all foods mm-hmm. does help you yep. to reach spiritual states. And I think that's different. There's there's this argument of high, high vibrational, low vibrational foods, and that's what I was kind of subscribed to. And so yeah. after a couple of years, after a bunch of hair fell out, uh, oh, wow. I was like, you know, this probably ain't for me. And yeah. so my girlfriend, she wanted to eat eggs, and I was like, all right, I'll try it. It, it kind of just feels right to me. And then she did, and then we're like, all right. I kind of feel like I'm a burger, and I'm like, yeah, "Yeah, there it is. (laughs) And that's exactly (laughs) what we did. Grass-fed, baby. There was a place in Nashville that was grass-fed. They closed now, but they had grass-fed burgers, and we went there, and everything digested really nicely. And then I was like, you know what? I can't base my life on what other people tell me Mm. that – this it means that this is you're more spiritual if you do this it's ethical for this i need to really understand that and that really catapulted me into i feel like wanting to understand the world on a deeper level and Mm -hmm. arguments of eating a certain way and now i'm even right now i'm eating what's called the epi paleo diet which is um, a form of keto you could say Mm -hmm. and 
and it has to do with the sun's rhythms and eating at specific times of the day to reset uh, because of the premise is that left this is by dr jack cruz who's a neurosurgeon he just had a conversation with huberman about this but the the premise is is that leptin in your body is your body's resistant to that neurotransmitter which causes you to hold weight because for years i've been eating really healthy i haven't really felt like i've over ate but i still hold on to weight and it just didn't make sense to me and he when i listened to him talk he described that the exact thing and i was like yeah. oh shit so i the irony and where i'm getting with that how it relates <laughs> is that i'm eating only pretty much meat and dairy right now and i feel the best i've ever felt you do and that's a uh, scary game to play like a slippery slope game to play of like other people telling you how to eat to be spiritually it's like you're competing to see who can be the most spiritual so, yeah or to like obtain the, uh, the light body merkaba thing you know yeah you're just like just constantly trying to change everything you do and you never settle into any kind of pattern or habit because you're trying to out spiritualize the other person yeah and because you think that this is going to for me it was thinking I was going to get to higher levels of consciousness. It wasn't about other people. It was like, well, I can reach these higher levels too mm. if I just eat this way. Mm. And it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> and so... And fasting yeah, worked way can... better. Fasting is Absolutely. Crazy. Fasting is really... I feel better. I, haven't fa I fasted at the end of 2022, and it's like I feel like I download more stuff in that fasted state over like three or four days than I do over the six months prior i don't know why i don't do it more often i guess because it's hard but it is just, hard like, it yeah, taps you into something respect. it does yeah and i didn't feel that when i was not eating meat and that's what i was expecting to feel yeah. i tried it for a while so you know other people might have different experiences to me and i respect sure. that that's just my own personal yeah like nate diaz he's a you know nate diaz is uh ufc fighter i mean he i think he's vegan or at least some at some point he was vegan or vegetarian and i mean this guy is in there bleeding in the octagon and it works for him you would think you know as someone who is a high level athlete competing on the world stage they would not um have that type of benefit but for him it works you know yeah and that that kind of throws away the uh you know a lot of people like to characterize vegans as this like weak beta type thing to be but you know obviously that's not true there are plenty of uh, athletes that do that do uh, subscribe to a vegan diet. Yeah, I've never tried that. Right. I don't know that. I well, shout out it. to all my vegans out there and vegetarians. Yeah. Shout out I mean, vegans. If it works for you. <laughs> you do your thing. Like, don't yeah. let me convince you. Do your own research, yeah. and that's that's what I, my conclusion is. You know, because uh, Jesse, my uh, girlfriend, studies human design, so I get inundated just from being around someone who's into that. Yeah. And she talks about how human bodies are not all designed the same and that we need different food depending on our, our specific designs. And yeah. so that's really interesting to me. And it makes me wonder how specific diets might just work for people based on their body. Sure. And slash, or it could be because they're placeboing themselves to believe that it's good. <laughs> yeah. Probably a little bit of both. You know, I wish when I was younger that I was more in tune with like how my daily habits, my the food I ate, the things I did impacted how I felt. I think I had zero consciousness of of making the connection between what I was eating and how I felt. And uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's a normal thing or if I was just an idiot. But like now, I, I you know before we, before we got on today, I did sauna, did a cold shower. I'm like, I want to feel as good as I can before I get on this podcast and have a good conversation. And like years ago, I would have never even tried to make those connections. I'm like, Oh, I'm just gonna, just gonna wing it and just figure it out. You know? Do you feel like it affects people even if they don't think about it? Or do you think if they think about it, it affects them? Mm. I think it, I mean, definitely sauna. I don't know if you like, I feel so good when I get out of the sauna. I don't know how I could not think about it. You know, like it's just like a complete state shift. And then the cold shower is terrible while I'm in it. And then I get out and I feel great. But yeah, there's definitely the part of me like, okay, now I've done this things, uh, these things. I've earned feeling good. I'm going to make sure I feel good and have a good, like, joyous state about me, you know? Yeah. Do you do any yeah. of those things? Do you do sauna or anything like that? 
how do you do sauna? Like, where do you I, do it? Well, I bought one off of Amazon. Uh, it's not like a big wooden. It was like nice. two or three hundred bucks. So uh, mm -hmm. before that, I would do it at the gym. So the gym gotcha. right down the road from me has a sauna, and it gets up to like 180 degrees, and it's brutal. I would feel like I was gonna die, and I have to like if I set a timer, I'm 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 not ending it early. And I there were a couple times where I really felt like like my hands would start tingling. And it's a 24 hour gym, so it would be in the middle of the night sometimes. And I'd be like, man, I hope I don't pass out in here and then like wake up as beef jerky or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, man. I gotta, I, I want to get a cold plunge, but those are ridiculously expensive. Other than you could just get a big tub, I guess, and put ice in it, but throw it out back, yeah. something like that, depending on where you live, too, how cold it is. But uh, for me, I don't. I haven't ever really got into sauna. I have absolutely wanted to. Yeah. I just haven't. I have been into cold exposure for like the past four months. And okay. I used to do it in about 55 degrees, 50 degrees, which is still, you know, it's not 34 like some crazy people want to do. Um, yeah. Crazy dedicated, that is. Um, yeah. wanna do. <laughs> but crazy I... I feel like the 50 was tough and yeah. I can get in the shower right now. Like I do take cold showers and mm. I have noticed an extreme difference. And I've told people this in my ability to like what you were saying earlier about jujitsu, your ability to actually continue to right. do things that are difficult in your life, which elevate it because you're like, if I can accomplish like, because here's the thing, some people get addicted to social media. I have problems with it sometimes too. And if I can get up, get in the shower or get outside, get this right now. It's for me. My schedule is I get up, I eat immediately. Cause that's part of the leptin and I diet. And then I go outside in the sun and then I'll take a cold shower depending on the day. And if I can do all of those things, I feel like, I've already got a shit ton of momentum yeah. and I don't want to waste my, all of that by just going back and I'm just doing, doing something that's not going to help me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you listen to Huberman. So I'm sure you've heard some of his thoughts on dopamine and how it relates to doing those types of things. That was really the thing that, I mean, I've done cold showers and sauna a little bit over the years, but it was like, I don't know, a few months ago, I started really listening to some of the science behind how when you do something like that, how you get this dopamine release for a few hours afterwards. So basically, you know, the old like do hard things, have a good life, do easy things, have a bad life type stuff. So um, it's really interesting listening to that. So I don't, I, he, he communicates in a way that makes it pretty easy to understand. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I like what he says I, for me when I, listen to him sometimes he talks about dopamine and he talks about caffeine mm -hmm. and for me i couldn't do caffeine you don't I, do I any just, caffeine I, I did it for about six months and it was extremely affecting everything about my life in a negative really? way besides like well i know pretty much everything because no matter what i would get too mm. i would be so wanting to do something physically that i couldn't tune into anything um, even like I try to tune into, I talk about this a lot, tuning into the universal intelligence, kind of like letting, letting the universe kind of insp give you responses to things. And you're being like, okay, this is what I'm going to do next based on how your body, your intuition feels. And that's how I've been living a lot. And I couldn't do that. Like all of this that I've accomplished in the last month of all the changes was without caffeine. And when I was having on caffeine the entire time, I was not doing super well. And I think it was because I was trying to force, uh, to force myself. This is what my mind thought the best idea was, but it really wasn't the best. And then when I sat back, stopped caffeinating myself, I could actually meditate and tune in and, and just be on constant awareness without the sense of like needing to go. Cause I think caffeine is good for people who are, uh, who are like working physical jobs that are just, mm -hmm. you go from A to B, there's no mental. Some people think that, you know, during the enlightenment periods of way past Renaissance, 
they actually associated caffeine with logic and reasoning and they used to go to, you know, cafes and that's how it got started. Uh, but for me, it's almost more difficult to do so. And I feel like I'm much better without caffeine. I don't know. What's your experience with it? Well, so you seem like you are a naturally energetic person. Is that fair to say? So I wonder if sure. that plays into it. Like your baseline is already high high enough to where caffeine just kicks you out of the stratosphere. It's too much. You know? <laughs> yeah. Like, like I, I feel like uh yeah. I I definitely drink coffee and um I drink too much coffee. I drink about a pot every morning. And uh I think I'm like not naturally energetic in the way you are. Like uh need a little bit to get me going. I don't need it, but I prefer it. And uh like I've noticed even the reverse of like, you know, like, uh, taking a Xanax or something, it just makes me want to sleep. And I see other people, they'll take them and it like helps them. And I'm like, I mean, I definitely don't need that shit. It just makes me want to take a nap. So I do think people are like at a baseline energy level. Like my heart rate, especially as I've gotten in better shape, my resting heart rate is like 46, which is pretty low. Mine which too. Which is good. Mine's like 46, 48. I have a whoop. Oh yeah, yours. Is- I'm dragging it. Yeah, well, good. Yeah, yeah that's what that's what I got too. Um, nice. So that's good. Congratulations. That's a good heart rate. <laughs> I have the same uh, one. The same whoop. I, it's in the you it's do in the car. Yeah, man. Bag. Yeah. <laughs> man, this thing really helped. Uh, maybe you can get whoop as a sponsor now. Um, this really helped me get an insight on my sleep and stuff. Like I I got it because I thought. No, well, I got it because I heard. I guess they were using it on uh, the sober October thing on Rogan. I was like, I'll try it. But like I learned so much about my sleep and the main thing I took away was if I want eight hours of sleep, I need to be asleep for nine hours because you wake up a couple times every hour without realizing it. And the whoop shows that. And I looked into it and it's like, yeah, the, a, a normal person will wake up one or two times every hour, I guess for a couple minutes. And you don't really realize it. Maybe you'll wake up and you'll go pee or something, but you wake up a couple times every hour. So if you really want to get eight hours of sleep, you need to be asleep for nine hours, which means I need to be in bed for 10 hours because it takes me a while to fall asleep. Like I have to read and all that stuff before I I can actually get into the state where I fall asleep. So yeah. uh, Shout out whoop sponsor this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) I heard about it from Chris Williamson who was doing a, it does modern wisdom. I don't know you heard about that podcast. No, I haven't. Uh -uh. I, I absolutely love Chris. I'd love to be, um, sponsored by whoop at some point you know i think it's really interesting stuff i'm gonna write that down i thought you uh, said it's called modern wisdom yeah chris is so he's one of my favorite podcasters and so with his podcast i just heard it one time i'm like you know what the same reasoning as you did i want to understand my sleep am i sleeping Mm -hmm. enough why do i feel tired all the time and it actually helped me to i stopped caffeine because of the whoop too, because I was reading my things and I'm like, I just need to see what my life is like without it. And you know, the withdrawal is tough, but Mm -hmm. after I got past it, I feel calmer. I feel like I'm and this is may not be the case for everyone, but I feel more spiritually in tune in a sense. I feel like that, that archetypical life that people will tell you you want to live like just peace where you can just do what you want to do work hard or at least for me this is what i look at this is a successful life to me i'm doing something that i enjoy doing but then i can relax afterward Mm -hmm. and i don't have to push myself to where it's it's um i want to have to push myself to, to the point past uncomfortability but because i think there's value in that in growing as a person but at the same time not forcing because it's so hard to force a skit how do you do that and so yeah, and it's and it's obvious to when people are doing that, you know. You can see it when right. someone's forcing something like that. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, that man, that's been my caffeine experience, but in general, I'm curious, do you take any other supplements, anything else? Yeah, so uh, I um so mainly caffeine and then vitamins. I was doing Athletic Greens. I do Athletic Greens sometimes. Um and then just like regular vitamins, uh, vitamin D, big time. Uh, but I also sometimes I'll take something called kratom. I don't know if you ever heard of that. It's uh, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, it's like a. Uh, a lot of people take it's something that a lot of people who are addicts take. They were like previously addicted to pills or 
something like that. They'll take it either to get off of it or it gives like a similar feeling. Um, I, I like it for the energy properties, but it's actually something that was used in Indonesia for a long time. It's a cousin of the coffee plant. So in the morning, I wake up and I'll drink coffee. I did try to do the thing where you'd wait two hours to drink coffee. But all I could think about for those two hours was coffee. So I was like, fuck it. I might as well just drink this anyway. And um, then throughout the day, I'll take like a little bit of Kratom and it just kind of helps me just with mood and stuff. But I don't know, man. I don't think that is really an optimal thing to do because sometimes I've noticed that I've used it as a crutch a little bit. Um, I did I did quit it at one point and it is very addictive. Uh, and like I noticed... It's kind of the same thing with fasting. I had a lot more clarity about things. I couldn't sleep for shit, but I had a lot more clarity about things. And so now I'm like, You're just on Kratom? No, off of it. Off, off of it. it. Okay. Yeah, but I think I was taking a little too much. I was, you know, I'm, I have an indulgent, I have a, a side of me that's a little indulgent where like I haven't drank alcohol in two months. I wasn't an alcoholic, but, um, you know, I would drink maybe. I don't know, once or twice a month, and I always end up drinking way more than I should. So um, I just was like, man, I just, I, 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 I'm sick of feeling hungover at all. I don't ever want to feel that. So like now we went to a comedy club two months ago. I had a beer and a little bit of whiskey, and I still felt hungover the next day. I was like, what the fuck? So yeah, so I haven't drank in two months. Um, so now I'm gonna. I'm trying to scale back caffeine and scale back kratom, and just really, I'm with you. Though. I think, I think there is something to those things where you you use it, whether it's for the reason you're using it, like I'm using it as a crutch, so then it I don't get to actually process my emotions and feelings because I'm sedating myself or um, caffeinating myself. But also, I just I don't I can't imagine that's really good for you to put in your body long term. Like I've heard people talk about, I don't know if it's true or not, like it calcifying. Your pineal gland to, uh, drinking too much caffeine. I don't know if that's. Uh, have you heard anything like that before? I've heard that about other things. I haven't heard yeah. that about caffeine. Yeah, I've heard that before. I don't know. I don't know if it's true. It's hard to tell. There, are, um, there's a, a, a large subsect of the jujitsu community that is very, you know, the old school like pure martial artist type people that are like no caffeine, no sugar, all this type of stuff. And they seem to be pretty successful martial artists, so I don't know. Maybe there's something to that. I'm not going to cut out sugar. Though. That's I don't even know how you could. <laughs> I don't know if it's possible to completely cut out sugar. That would mean you're, you're eating no fruit. I did. That's what I'm doing. You did? No <laughs> sugar? Ironically. Really? Jeez. What, yeah, what's that like? That's what keto is. Like, yeah. Your well, body is producing ketones. And, so you're uh, not eating any – you don't eat any fruit at all? I Like I said, I only have meat and dairy. Wow. That's pretty much it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there are, I mean, pretty much it's, yeah, I, I, I'm having, my meals are beef, eggs, and cheese, and beef, egg, and cheese, <laughs> and, you know, some beef, and then, no, I'm just kidding, but, you know, <laughs> I can beef. get, right, you get different types of beef, and, you know, beef jerky, and stuff mm. like that, you can't get it if it's got, some of it have sugar in it, some beef jerky does, sure, uh, beef, yeah. it's like teriyaki or something, yeah, mm. How, if you're to answer your question, what is it like? I feel the best I've ever felt. Like I said, yeah, I feel sure. the most clear that I ever have. I don't get tired after I eat. I actually, that was a big problem. I would be like, oh, I have a bunch of potatoes, and I'm like, I'm just gone. Yeah, you know? just so, knock out on the couch like it's Thanksgiving. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I feel the most energetic and just committing to eating a certain way for eight weeks, which is what I'm doing. I'm on. Right now, I've been in ketosis for probably about a week now. I've been doing this like two weeks. And it's definitely a different experience. And I think the overall message that I'm getting from doing the experience is more along the lines of just doing a, a thing mm -hmm. completely mm -hmm. is yeah. almost as, as valuable as like maybe the specific results. I don't know what the results I'll get it are yet, but just... Like you're saying, you you stopped drinking alcohol. I stopped drinking alcohol too, and um, just doing the diet with no exceptions gives you a sense that you can actually accomplish something. Because that's the thing. I think people, 
at the end of the day, this is how I see a lot of people's struggles. They just don't understand that the reason why they're not accomplishing things in their life is because they can't even depend on their own word. Mm. So if you can't yeah. tell yourself you're going to do something, you're going to follow this diet for two weeks, you're going to fast for two days, you're, or you're going to meditate for 15 minutes, if you can't follow through with that, you can't even rely on yourself to do anything, right? You're so at odds within yourself, then how are you going to be able to do anything? And no wonder you feel worthless because you can't even listen to your own words. You can't even listen to what you want to do because your mind has tricked you, really, at the end of the day. The ego has convinced you that the soul doesn't have a say and that the ego is running the show. So what I found is that if you can just commit to following through when you say you're going to do something like what we even talked about at the beginning of the conversation with true, like masculinity in a sense, that's what you described it as following through. Yeah. If you could just do that with your life in general, even if it's small things, yeah. that's how you develop the self-confidence to actually do the bigger things in your life that you want to accomplish. Like I wouldn't be able to be where I'm at today if I wasn't able to follow through, you know, there's yeah. no shot. And for a while there, I actually regressed. So for if people are like, well, I used to, but I'm not now. I wrote a book in two months, and then I fell off. And then I fell back into the habits. And What, what do you mean by you fell off? Like you fell off with your eating habits or your... Yeah, um, I, I did exactly what... Well, I did exactly what I'm saying, which is... not. I, I did what I'm saying not to do, which is I'm mm. letting the ego decide what i'm doing even when that's not what i really want to do so the easiest way to describe it would be like i know that i want to just read this book or listen to this specific thing that is beneficial for me in some respects about learning about the way reality works but then youtube shorts though <laughs> but then <laughs> yeah. you know oh, the, the short form content kind of hooks you and I, oh, it's it, so I, addictive. I got addicted for a long time, but I was still making content. So I was still kind of, but it wasn't the level that I was at. Mm -hmm. And now I feel like I'm back at that level because I finally just decided enough is enough. And at the end of the day, I feel like that is the most important part is that coming to the present moment and just saying, I'm tired. I'm so tired of living this life where I'm not doing what I really want to do and yeah. getting all that energy out of the past, stop guilting, stop saying that this is wrong, that you did these things, and just bring that to the present moment, and then also stop worrying about all the things you got to do in the future. Bring that energy all back into this moment, and then when you have all the energy of the past and future in this now moment, you can, this is how I felt, I can actually do what I want to do. Yeah. Because I have the energy to actually tell my ego no. And actually stick to it. I do feel like there's an energetic proportion. It. There, there's an energetic proportion or perspective or amount that you need in order to say, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah, and when you first do it, it, it feels like you're maybe Sisyphus pushing the boulder. And, you know, you're, you're doing it and then you regress and then you do it again and it's such a heavy weight. But if you can get the small things – I used to kind of – this is like probably a ego thing, but I used to think it was silly that they recommended that in the military, they recommended you make your bed uh, first thing. I know they require them to do, but like that was a thing that military guys would recommend other people do make your bed right when you wake up. I'm like, I'm going get, to be getting back into it. But there really is something to that. Do one small thing that's really easy to do and you build that momentum to doing the harder things. And you do need some ability to have some introspection to be able to even see where the uh, where where the errors in thought are which is where meditation comes in or maybe community because it's super hard it's super hard to change your habits when you're the only one doing it and if you have a community of people which is why jujitsu is so important for me that's a place i go and everybody's there doing difficult things so the type of person you're going to run into and develop a relationship with is going to be different than the type of person you would meet at a bar or whatever you know like no shade on going to the bar but how do you feel like your uh you could throw shade it's okay <laughs> <laughs> i don't enjoy it, it anymore kinda... man like i I never thought I'd be that guy. Like I never thought I was laughed at. I thought it was such a like just corny thing. It's really just I, like I never was into it too. I just like having conversations. You're at a bar and um, 
the music's too loud. You can't talk and people are just drunk and, you know, I, I do like going to comedy clubs and I'll go to a concert. You know, I think there's other ways to have that type of entertainment. It's just like, you know, especially I'm not a single man. So, I mean, there's a, you go to a bar for a certain reason. Usually, I mean, my girl and I will go every now and then with a group of friends, but I just don't enjoy it. Uh, what, what are your, your habits around, um, creating specifically? You talked about like the, like getting sucked into, shorts or tiktoks like you never feel good after that i feel like t- for me when i am scrolling mindlessly i have the hardest time switching my gear switching into creator mode like i feel like my mind is just soggy and numb mm-hmm. how do you find your way yeah. out of that into back into creator mode i go and walk or go good or go good night <laughs> yeah to put it simply I sleep, take a 20 minute nap, not like a long one. I just need to completely reset because mm-hmm. I'm with you. It is very difficult. So I'm, I'm either, I'm resetting. That doesn't have to be inside, by the way. I'll, in Phoenix here, because I'm in Arizona, the mm-hmm. sun is always out most of the time. So I'm going out and I'm just, I'm sitting in that sun. And that sun gives me a reset. And I might throw some music on yeah. um, to reset as well. So that, I go on a walk. Uh, it depends on how inundated I am. Sometimes you feel like you are so stimulated that you need to keep keep, keep taking in information. And then mm. I'll try to find something that is like the middle because really sometimes I want to study things, but then you get so to, out of whack, like you're saying. So then I'll choose a middle ground. What's a show or something entertaining mm. that yeah. is not completely boring, but at the same time, it's it's still educational in some respect is giving you some sort of knowledge so that way i feel like i'm still getting something and then i'm kind of weeding myself off of yeah i like that you said that i i find a lot of value in in fiction like that I, um because for a while i was also thinking i don't need to watch tv shows but i found that to be a pretty good reset too like even watching something like breaking bad or just a really well done show you can learn Rick and morty yeah, like, yeah, Rick and Morty. You can learn about things, and even if you're not learning about concepts, you're learning about um, you're picking up how thing how they shoot things with a camera. Even though, even if your content type is very different, um, yeah, I think sometimes you know there's this old trope of um, what, what they say that poor people have big TVs and rich people have libraries, which is bullshit. Rich people have massive TVs, um, but rich people got a Kindle now. Yeah, yeah, they got everything. What you, you know, like you can learn things from fiction. I I really enjoy reading fiction and watching really really well done shows. That's like what my goal is with my content, in a sense, to be somewhere in the middle, to mm-hmm. where it's not just boring. Uh, like these these podcasts are meant for people that love conversations, yeah. and I love conversations. I listen to podcasts. That's one reason why I love doing podcasting because I think there's a lot of value in the back and forth. That's why podcasting is so big, right? Yeah. Um, but it's a hang, you know, you're like kicking it with people that aren't there in the room with you and you have access to other people that you wouldn't otherwise you have to like go out and meet people and then, you know, decide whether or not you want to have a friendship with this person. And now you can just tap into all these different conversations happening. Yeah. It's yeah, like your consciousness too. kind of is in the room. Yeah. You know, in a weird, some people might consider it magic, in a weird way, we are stopping time, putting it into a container, and then giving this someone else is able to basically biolocate their consciousness to listen into this conversation. Dude, that's that's what Stephen time. King says. That's what Stephen King says. He says books. He talks about books like that. His writing like that. Like he he says they're a uniquely portable magic is what he calls books. And he says that exact thing you just said. That he when he writes a book, he's transporting his consciousness into the hands and into the mind of the reader and now through the Shout decades Stephen King. <laughs> yeah man i love dude that's what most of these books I don't, you probably can't really see because they're far back but most of the uh up here are stephen king books i love stephen king wow i yeah. actually haven't gotten into fiction i no. i'd like to i'm i'm really on the content uh yeah bandwagon right now so it's hard for me to get in because i'm like I'm in this mode right now. I just feel like there's seasons of life. Mm-hmm. And the season that I'm in 
is I'm reading stuff. I get ideas. Oh, this is brilliant. I really like how this is done. I like this theory. I like this person. Can I, how can I share this with people? Yeah. That's what my life is. So I love it, but I, I have spent, I spend most of my time reading things like the Bhagavad Gita. It's like literally mm-hmm. right here. Like this, is, this is one of my favorite books. Like if someone to ask me, if you, somebody did ask me one time in comments, they asked me if you could read one book forever, what would it be? And I would have to say it's probably this book, this actually series. It's, it's a Bhagavad Gita series by Pramahansa Yogananda. Um, oh, okay. He did a commentary on it. It's like a thousand pages. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know he did. I have. Uh, what's I'm gonna his? do videos about this. Yeah, do yeah. I would love to see those. I I have. I can't remember the name of the book. Was Diary of a Yogi or something? Yo- Autobiography yeah. of Yogi. <laughs> yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. He's an interesting character. He's not like uh, what yeah, you would bro- tend to think of a guru as. He's very different. Oh my god, he, dude has. There's so much content I can make about that guy. I'm going yeah. to. I have it's another awesome. video I'm gonna make about how he talks about in his books uh, that Jesus went to India and he studied and he went on the Silk Road and mm-hmm. it's wild. Yeah, I've always wanted, I always wanted to learn more about that idea of, of Jesus going to India because it makes sense, even just from like the time period where Jesus was alive and his teachings. Like they... And, and it's interesting if you tell someone who is very Christian this, they will get offend, deeply offended, but uh, that a lot of Christian teachings are very similar to Buddhism. I mean, it's a, they're kind of a lot of saying the same thing. Yeah. Deny that, Even deny that flesh, you know, stuff like that. Like, it's like disconnect from the uh, desire. 100%. Yeah, I mean, it's, I was just studying how in the Bible and in the Lord's Prayer, it says, done as it is in heaven on earth or as earth as it is in heaven or something like that. And that's basically the as above, so below principle in hermeticism. That is true, yeah. <laughs> Law of correspondence or principle. So mm-hmm. Christianity just seems... And there's this whole idea that I, people that I am friends with that are convinced that Jesus didn't actually exist and that it's just like different myths. Like there's these different deities that like had this story... The, the same story as Christ, and it just is, it's interesting. It's very interesting. I'm not sure what the truth is. I, I That's what I love about reality. It's like, yeah. I don't have to decide. Oh, Some man. people are very convinced, like, it is this way. I'm just like, bro, I just like exploring. Yeah, you, can, you can't prove anything. My son, uh, I told you, we, like, have a lot of interesting conversations. He, he has having a little bit of an existential crisis right now. He's 14, and he's like, I just realized you can't ever prove anything happened. Like I can't prove that five <laughs> minutes ago happened. <laughs> and I'm like, well done, young Padawan. You are <laughs> <laughs> welcome to our. You are line, learning. Right? Yeah, welcome to the existential <laughs> angst of being a human. <laughs> That's right. Like we don't even know. I was saying this while I was in Virginia, bro. I was like, we don't even know that we exist. Like that we were here yesterday is what I was saying. We don't even I, I think we can know that we're experiencing something. That's the only thing. Right. That's why yeah. some, some people say the only thing I know is I am. Mm-hmm. I am aware, yada yada. But I think that that is really true. We can't even prove that Bobby Smith wasn't in this body yesterday and I'm just have the memories of Bobby who was doing shit and that's why they fucked up yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Know. Well it's you know, if you think about the um What's the theory called the is it the theory of everything or the multiple universes theory where um you know everything is happening at everything that is happening right now is happening in infinite universes but with slight variations it's like it's almost like every decision you make if you ascribe to that or even if you're just pondering it it's almost like every decision you make you're splitting off so if you decided to do this like in another universe you decided to do that so we're constantly like uh, traveling through portals into different dimensions, and it's an interesting. Have you thought ever seen the movie? At the very least, for sure. Have you ever seen the movie? I didn't mean to cut you off. Have you ever seen no, the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once? Yeah, I watched it uh, about two months ago. Really, I love it. Okay. I love that they won an Oscar. So, that was awesome. It was a great movie. Yeah, that's cool. I feel like that movie is based on quantum physics, and people don't understand that, right? Because the whole concept of the multiverse actually comes from 
interpretations of the double slit experiment. And in those interpretations, one of them is the many worlds interpretation. That is exactly what you're saying. That for every decision you make, there's a world where you chose something else. So if you chose this, another universe is created where you chose the, the other decision. Or not only that, every possible decision that you could have made. Yes, a no, a maybe, I'll do it later, yada, yada. Everything. So the premise of the movie is you can tap into those still by doing random shit. <laughs> it's yeah, so yeah, because they have them doing just crazy things you would never do. Like I would wear a book as a hat and then rub my stomach right now to transport myself to another <laughs> universe. Shit, maybe we should try it. Exactly. I don't know. <laughs> what do we do right now? I mean, what um, are we going to do? Just throw the book out the window. Just do a hula hoop with my ring light if I wasn't uh, too fat to do that. Could try that. <laughs> um. <laughs> I can't even fit in mine either. This shit is small, you know. But uh, here's the thing: I it could be real. Who knows? Maybe sometime in the future, maybe there is a Kang as well in the future that figures it out, figures time travel out, and is like overseeing everything. The Kang. Well, man, we have AI now. We have Chat GPT and all these things that are processing all the infinity of uh, human information or all of the history of human information processing it and uh, creating outputs from all that stuff like i really i've heard a lot of people talking about over the past five to ten years about how human life expectancy has a potential i mean it's possible where like someone who's 20 years old could live forever now and i mean obviously that sounds insane but if you think about the advances that can be made in healthcare through artificial intelligence have you have you played around with chat gpt at all i have Yes. Yes. It's pretty crazy. It's mm -hmm. pretty crazy that what it can do. Um but if you just what think about it, it I'm trying to keep going. Go ahead. Sorry, well, I, I was I, just I, saying I, that if you take all of the all of the research that's been done all, and all of the data all the data, biometric data and all the um data from the health industry, healthcare industry and you have these machine learning, large language models, all of this stuff. I'm probably not using some of the correct terminology here, but if you have it processing all of this stuff, the outputs can be pretty crazy. And we've already, our, just to give you an example, there was a guy who went to the vet, the veterinarian with his dog and the vet was basically like, you know, I'm sorry, I can't do anything. Uh, you're going to have to go home. Your dog's going to die. He goes home and he takes all of the information that the vet gave him, runs it through chat GPT, chat GPT, Gave him some kind of output that he took to another vet, and the vet saved his dog's life. And so, I yeah, you, I mean, I'm sure there's details. I don't know the details of what what the um, issue was with the dog, but um, yeah, I mean, he, he basically Chat GPT was able to take this information and and do an output. I mean, the other day my son had to get some blood work done, and he, you know, we got it on his little my chart thing. So we're reading it and I'm like, I don't know what any of this shit means. And so I was like, let's, let's put it all into chat GPT. And we put it in a chat GPT and we said, explain this to me as if I'm a fifth grader as in as simple terms as possible. And it did it. And I understood what was, he had like slightly raised liver enzymes. And so, you know, they're just making sure that there's nothing wrong. And I was like, okay. I mean, obviously a doctor can tell you these things, but it's just cool that you can process information like this. So when you say live forever, what do you, what do you mean by that? Eternal life. I don't know. I mean, this is something I've heard <laughs> people talk about that uh, Ray yeah. Kurzweil, I don't know if they mean in this, you know, are you familiar with Ray Kurzweil? Mm -mm. He, so he's the guy that talks about the singularity that by 2030 that we're going to be able to, um, I mean, that's one of his theories that we'll be able to basically live forever as conscious beings in like a robot or something like that, which freaks me the fuck out. And I don't think that's a good idea at all. Um, but there have been people that have said that, that healthcare advances, at least that we're going to reach what they call escape velocity, where for every year you live, your life can be extended by like 1.1 years at some point. That's a theory amongst some people. Um, but undoubtedly I could see where, our life expectancy can be expanded, can be extended to, you know, maybe a hundred or something like that. You know, that make that I can wrap my mind around. It makes sense that healthcare can 
then then it's interesting because you start to think about well what does society look like where you you know right now an octogenarian somebody in the 80s and the 90s it's like kind of i guess what is life expectancy like in 74 75 so people yeah. in their 80s or 90s it's a little bit more rare somebody who is a centenarian is even more rare what does a society look like where everybody lives to be 100 like what or 200 or 200 and, and they're capable of continuing to be, you know, if you're thinking economically, they're viable in the workforce. What does that look like? What does the retirement, what is the retirement age now? Is that a good thing? You know, like, is it good to live to 200 or is there, is that going to upset some kind of weird natural balance in the universe? It's just interesting stuff to think about. Right. I mean, <laughs> Is it karmically good for people to live for a hundred extra years? You know, like that's yeah. What do you, I'm yeah if about. you believe in reincarnation, like aren't you? Don't you just want to go ahead and reincarnate? This is um, somebody. I don't remember where I heard this from, but if, if like if I asked you if you wanted to live forever, you're, you'd probably say no. Do you want to live forever, like in this body? Do I want to live forever? No. Yeah. As you are now, I think no. most people would. But if you were 87 years old right now, and I asked you, are you ready to die right now? You most likely would be like, unless you, you know, like if you're healthy and you have a good life, you know, you like have your family, most likely you'd be like, no. And then if I asked you tomorrow, okay, you're 87 in a day, are you ready to die right now? Your answer is most likely going to be no. So it's like on some level, we do want to live forever. Well, hopefully I can live a life to where I'm 87. I can be like, fuck it. I already did everything I wanted to do. Yeah. That's what some but people still, like do. You would, like, like you walk in here, you're going to die. You wouldn't be like, ah, me, like, maybe tomorrow. Ask me again. You know, you wouldn't want <laughs> to do that. <laughs> yeah, I, I get what you're saying. It's hard to let go. I think that just comes down to letting go into the unknown. I mean, it's so hard to know what's going to happen next. And if it's going to be a good experience, if you're going to enjoy it, mm -hmm. you know, some people don't even think that there is another reincarnation, which as many people know on this podcast, it's, we've talked about it many times, reincarnation. I'm actually about to talk to a guy who was the grandson of somebody who ran the studies at university of Virginia on the kids who could remember their past lives. Um, so it's an ongoing thing that we're we're trying to discover if it's legit. But I have, I'm pretty sure that we're gonna keep going. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna keep going, and it's and it's not just one, right? It's not just a one and done. Do you fear death? No, because I'm living life in a way to where if I I'm giving everything I can every day. And I think if you can say that about your life, like I live today, like I've really studied stoicism and I really, uh, I have a shirt in my closet right now and um, I have many different shirts, obviously, <laughs> but there's a one specific shirt from my friend who had a uh, memento mori, which is a, the saying of remember death mm -hmm. used to have in the stoic days. And I have really been practicing that throughout my life of like, can I live a life to where, I'm good. If if, yeah. if today is yeah. my day, I don't know uh, if I, if I don't live a life like that where I feel like I'm putting in what I my potential every day. Then yeah, I wouldn't be afraid because it was like yeah. I could have done better. But I don't want to live a life where the person I am does nothing w close to their potential. Then eventually they realize what they could have been after they die. Yeah. And that's they say one of my, hell. That's one of my biggest fears. Same. If I have if I have one, you know. That's the same. They say hell is where the person you are meets the person you could have been. Yeah, I mean, I that's it, right? That's what I was yeah. trying to say. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have the same feeling. Like, regret is my biggest fear, aside from losing one of my children. But, um, yeah, just thinking about being old and looking back, like, fuck, I'd spent my whole life just doing what, you know, this like doing what everybody else thought I should do or not taking chances, not taking risks. I'd much rather take risks and fail. Like have those type of regrets like, "Ah, I went for it. I should have zigged instead of zagged, but you know, at least I went for it and I tried it." And I want to get to the end of my life and look back and be like, "Hell yeah, I tried it. I'm, I fell flat on my face a lot of times, but I went for it." Yeah, I feel like that when I started living out of the rooftop tent and living nomadically. 
out of a rooftop a, tent yeah you didn't know that i lived at, i no. lived nomadically out of a rooftop tent with what, uh, what is a rooftop tent like you lived on someone's rooftop <laughs> that sounds like a <laughs> dumb question as it came out of my mouth i'm like that's this sounds uh, stupid uh, okay <laughs> I don't know what a rooftop tent is. <laughs> like, hey, uh, can I live I on your roof? I see you got some extra space up there. Can I, like... <laughs> oh, shit, man. Uh, no, that's not it. That's not it. It's, you put it on your, your car. Gotcha. You, you, right. So... <laughs> uh, makes you more take sense. a... Yeah, so we had a Mazda. So most, most people do it in, like, Jeeps or, like, trucks mm. and stuff. We had a Mazda CX-5, one-wheel drive, baby. And we uh, got a custom roof rack, and we put a tent on top of it, and that's what we lived out of for a year. That's dope. So Where did you, where did you travel to? All over. Yeah, we stayed in – one of my favorite places was in – it's called Port Aransas, which is by Corpus Christi, Texas, which is uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And you can camp for like $12 a, a year or something. Oh, wow. And you can, you can, but it's just on the side of the beach. Like you're literally on the beach. There's no hookups. There's nothing. There's porta potties, but like, it's just beachfront. And I, that was so cool to do. There was really unique things. I just wasn't able to figure it out financially at that point. And this is way yeah. before any of my stuff blew up and I was just trying to make it online. And because there was a long time period where it didn't work before it did. And yeah. so, yeah. That uh, we went, that was cool. We went to Moab. We went, we spent a lot of time dispersed camping in Sedona. Uh, other than that, we went to Colorado as well and camped out west of Colorado Springs. So, yeah, we went all over the place. What was yeah. the first? So, you, you said that you did that before your content started blowing up. What was the first time you got traction? That's always interesting to me when I see people who we're working on something for a long time and it wasn't working. And then they get that first spike like, Oh, okay. What was that first thing for you? The first spike was going on the talk and I just wasn't on it at all. And I started going on there and I was talking about science and spirituality in a way where I was not really creative before I was creative. And it was like, I just felt like my presentation wasn't looking back. I felt mm -hmm. like my presentation wasn't good. And I wasn't being super authentic. Like, I wasn't just, like, getting on and saying how I felt. It was like there was a level of a mask yeah. uh, behind insecurity or whatever it might be. Now, I, when I went on TikTok, I had my friends Matt Nash had convinced me. They're like, okay, we made it on TikTok. You should try it. And I'm like, it's for kids, but I guess. So <laughs> I tried it, and then I started talking about the law of one, and then 200,000 views, 300,000 views. Over and over with that and truth hidden in plain sight videos, which was like I would green screen record a movie, put it on a clip and then talk about it. I still do those and I still talk about Love One. I actually just posted my first YouTube video that was legit edited for my new YouTube channel, the second channel, oh, not wow. this one. I'll have to check it out. And and yesterday and it did really well and it was about the law of one. Cause I, I actually did that on purpose. Cause I'm like, look, the callback to the original videos that did well was a law of one. I should do a breakdown of the law of one on as my first video, just for yeah. like nostalgia. And so, yeah, I just did that. And that's why I feel on point because I, that's what I wanted to do all along. Like when I first got on social media, it was YouTube. I was like, mm. I, I just want to create YouTube videos. And I did that for like three months and I got nothing, no traction. And my videos weren't that great, but Everybody was like, "Ooh, short form. If you go on, uh, if you go on IGTV, ha. you'll get traction." And I'm like, "Okay." And I did it, and it didn't work. But you know, I got better and better and better. Yeah. So that was kind of my journey. It, it kind of led me all the way back to YouTube. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That era of like 2018, 19, and 20 was such a huge opportunity for people on mm -hmm. TikTok. You know, like, I think yeah. there are these bubbles, these moments where like, if you go on TikTok now and you're good, you can still blow up. But like, I, that was around when I, I think I got on there in 2019, but I didn't go all in, in the way that I should have. Um, yeah. YouTube is interesting too, because they actually have the, um, like the search engine behind it. You know, you, you, it's people use YouTube as a search engine. 
And I think some hundred percent TikTok that way. Yeah. You know what's wild yeah. about talk though is that I posted it. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the YouTube video and I'm posting the first bit of it to Instagram and and to TikTok into YouTube Shorts. And you're saying that about TikTok right now, but I posted the video 24 hours ago. Okay. On and shorts? guess how many views on TikTok? On TikTok. And guess how it was the first half. There's about three minutes. Guess how many views it has? 173,000. Keep going. Higher. 321,000. <laughs> Keep going. Half a milli. Keep going. 1.2. No, okay. <laughs> Take it easy. <laughs> no, it has fucking seven hundred and fourteen thousand. Wow, that's crazy. In what? In twenty four hours? Yeah, it must be. A, yeah, that's really good. It must be a great video. I have to check it out. I get. I, I filmed that <laughs> shit in my backyard. <laughs> but yeah, no, I put a lot of effort into writing it and making sure yeah. like it was entertaining and you mm -hmm. know the camera angles and the specific editing. So there was a lot that goes into these videos. It's not just like super easy to make because no. essentially you're your own producer, you're yeah. a screenplay writer, you're your own editor. And so it's a, it's a full-time gig for sure. But, uh, you know, it pays off in moments like that. But you know, the, the thing, the sad part about it is, is like, that's nothing like getting 714,000 on YouTube because if you get that on YouTube, Oh yeah. You get paid the people. Well, well that, yeah. But more like the people stick around They're gonna stick uh, around. on TikTok. Yeah. I have over half a million on TikTok or just about, and sometimes my videos do nothing. And that's because yeah. people don't have any brand kind of, not brand, but any, any really, it's so attention grabbing that people yeah, don't really, yeah, they don't develop a connection to you because TikTok is more promoting the best videos, not people you follow's videos, which is, yeah. that's a little why the difference between that and Instagram and YouTube. So if, if I got that much on YouTube, yeah, I think if you do that once on YouTube, if you get like seven hundred thousand, that's gonna keep. That's gonna. Whew, yeah, you're set you're up to, to really grow your channel from there. Exactly. But that's what's cool but, though is that we have these tools that you can. That that's a possibility if you're good at what you do. That you can have one piece of content that is usually on the tail end of hundreds of videos, but one piece of content that does really really well. And if you capitalize on that moment and you continue doing variations of that or um, explore concepts um, similar, like adjacent to it and continue to create quality, you can really create a pretty dope life for yourself. That just did not exist for our parents or grandparents. Like it wasn't even a 100%. possibility. I remember growing up thinking about like, I had a little period when I was a kid where I wanted to be famous and like, I wanted to be a singer. I, mean, I, I even sang at my, my high school pageant. And I looking back, I'm like, I can't believe wow. I did that. I'm not saying ushers, you got it bad in front of my whole school. I don't know. And I was not this confident kid. I don't know what, I guess I was like watching usher videos and was like, I want to be like that. And, um, but at that time to become famous, you had to get discovered. Right. So I was like, maybe if I sing, I'll get discovered and all this shit. Now it's like, no, you, you actually can, I mean, still obviously that happens. People get discovered and put onto bigger platforms and whatnot, but it's not, it's the lot, the control is a lot more in your hands. And if you, you develop a organic audience, you can really do anything. You just gotta be good. Are you good enough? And that's where I think people that this is one of the biggest mistakes I see. And obviously I don't have the following you have, but one of the biggest mistakes I see people make when they first start creating content is they're so focused on the algorithm. They think the algorithm is there to suppress them. And they're like, Hey, uh, everybody share my video. The algorithm doesn't want me to be seen. It's like, if your video is good enough, it will get views. I mean, it, 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 over time, you're going to have t times where you start feeling like, fuck, this video was really good. Why is it not getting views? And then your next video you spend two seconds on and it gets 200,000. But yeah, I think. Too but yeah, I think you're, you are a hundred percent correct, bro. And one thing that I really want to add in there is that you're saying that you thought this video was really good and it didn't get views. I posted a video about a butterfly two years ago, and it was about an analogy about how butterflies can't fly or don't turn into butterflies from caterpillars. If you open up their wings for them, they need to break out of the, they need to break out of the chrysalis mm -hmm. themselves or else they can't fly. Okay. I posted that two years ago and it didn't do super high. Right. So I just, 
you know, I was just messing around the other day, like two weeks ago, and I was like, you know what? I don't have any content ideas. This is before I figured out what I was going to do YouTube again. And I was like, let me just repost it. And I can show you here. You can see on the screen, 761,000. The... <laughs> just because I reposted it. That, yeah, that's and another one. Reposting so content. So what I, the point, that's on Instagram. The point is, is that just because it doesn't hit the algorithm well doesn't mean it was a bad video. Mm -hmm. It actually just might not reach the people that are interested in your content. And so that's another thing I had to learn. It's like, I'm going to do everything I can to make videos better. But I also know that sometimes it just doesn't reach the right people. And that doesn't mean yeah. my content is bad. All I can do is make it, set it, focus on the next one. The right. best thing that I did once I put this video out was I did not look at the numbers. I, I even yeah. though that video is, it, it got a lot that new skit I just told you about. Yeah. I wasn't concentrating on the numbers. You know what I did yesterday after I posted it, I wrote my next script yeah. and I already have it completely done. And then this morning I went out and filmed it again. And that right there is the difference between somebody who's going to make it and somebody who's not in, in a, sh in a, in a quicker way, because People get so focused on what happens to their content after they post it instead yep. of just focusing on how can I be the best artist, whether that's a visual artist, a creative artist, a music artist. How can I be the best at what I do? And that being the because the best is subjective, but how can I be the most creative, authentic version of myself where I feel like I am reaching my potential with the tools I have available? Not even because that's the thing, too. People get focused on camera equipment. They don't have the nice this or that. It's just like, but what do you have? When you look at your life, what do you have? What can you do with this? And what can you make of yourself? And you're right. It is brilliant. You don't even need nice camera stuff to develop an insane life for yourself. And right now really is the moment. I think that we'll still have the moment um, continuing. But right now, because if you look at, I do look at algorithms a bit just to kind of keep up because, you know, I do it full time. So, yeah, it well, you've sense. reached that level where some of that stuff is valuable to you and it is not an impediment to your creative process. Exactly. Like the thing that I keep up on is YouTube is trying to compete with TikTok in the ability for people to go viral because YouTube, from my understanding, has realized that people like TikTok because you can be nobody and then just hit it. Mm. So with shorts specifically and with other with your longer form videos too, they have made it so that any short can do the same thing that it does on TikTok. So there just knowing that makes you want to invest because what you're saying about TikTok if a couple of years ago is where YouTube Shorts is right now. Yeah. And so it's just like finding the next thing. And that, that was it. That's how people got famous on YouTube. I don't think these people who were doing it at the beginning were super good, but they were right. the only ones doing it. Same thing you with know? Vine, YouTube, Snapchat. Although Snapchat didn't have the discoverability early on, so that was a little bit harder. But yeah, yeah, a lot of it is timing. And then, of course, the it's, it's like, I guess, three things. Timing, how good are you at it, and are you able to – probably the most important thing is are you consistently showing up and doing like the thing you're saying as soon as you put something out immediately start on the next thing i wish there was some kind of app that could make it where i don't ever, ever even see the numbers of what my videos do like i wish i could turn it off and then you know maybe at some point because when you go into the app it shows you right there and you see the numbers and you get all the notifications and that could be another addiction where you're like refreshing you're like wow this thing is going crazy you know, I've fallen the, into that. Yeah, trap and, it, and it did happen to me. Yeah, uh, that was not hard not to when you're like a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand. What's that? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm gonna be in the next Mr. Beast. <laughs> right. That's what it seems like. And yeah. so, for me, that was just I had to turn off all notifications on Instagram and on everything. I don't really respond to comments ever because of that. Because it will take away from my life. Like, in and so, it's cool now that. Like what I'll do is I'll try to get on there and just as somebody who wants to help people and give them an idea because, you know, and YouTube back in the day, you should be like, check out this at the end of the video, but you can't really do that on TikTok. And so what I do is I go in on a couple comments and people are like, where can I find the rest of the video blank? And then I'll, and I'll comment that and I'll put it towards the top and I'll like look for a couple. But other than that, I'm not answering questions. And I love how Instagram has made the feature of you can pin your own comment. TikTok took away the pin feature on all comments. 
but Instagram. Oh yeah, they used you to have. Pin, you could pin your own comment on TikTok, and you can't now. You can pin other people's comments. Wow. I, I think you might be able to pin, pin your own. I'm not sure, but you could at least do other people's. But on Instagram, you can do both. And so now I just pin what I want people to know at the top. Like, if you want to join the Patreon to help support these videos, just pin that comment, then pin, check out the rest of the video. And then that way, it's like, this is what I want people to know because people don't even, sometimes people don't even want to read the, read the descriptions. Yeah. So it's just like, it's in the comments because people go right to the comments. Yeah. And I understand the psychology of it. I get it. I'm not faulting people. So you put it right there. So it's like developing an infrastructure as a creator to put yourself in a frame of mind to where you can succeed doing what you like to do and not trying to cater to what other people like, because mm -hmm. that's, that was the thing that really beat me up for a while is when you start getting more of a following, you get more haters and then you start to take it personally. But then it just is this process of realizing that it doesn't matter what other people have to say besides the people that you know actually are looking out. Like, if you tell me my video sucks because of this, I'm going to take you seriously because I know that you're actually coming from a genuine place. But I'd say 95% of the people that are commenting telling you your video sucks are just doing it because of they're mad for some reason at you yeah. or at the world or what at their life. Oh, yeah, and, and if you went and looked and at all of their comments way. on other people's videos, it'd probably be the same. It's like the... If you ever read Yelp reviews, there are people that go on Yelp and they just leave shitty reviews for restaurants they haven't even been to. And you can look at their profile and there's like 20 or 30 negative comments. I'm, and, and some people really hate watch. That's what they go on the internet to do. Yeah, you can That's get caught up in that. Put it. Do, you, do you like not read comments at all? Or do at you... At this point, I read comments on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. And oh that's it. And you are they better? Like, are they better quality? Probably yeah. more people that follow you are. You're probably getting from more of your followers than. Well, right? I just because I just started on YouTube and I want to. If it's uh, a smaller audience, I want people like I, that's the audience that I'm really interested in right now, because YouTube is like what I really want to make. That's what I want mm -hmm. to be like my number one thing besides this. I really love the podcast. Um, so YouTube and the podcast, I I do read comments on on those. But like I said, it's so hard for me on Instagram because it reaches, it's starting, it, the algorithm is getting better at reaching more people, but that in turn is going to get a lot of people who are just salt. So I know Joe Rogan says he doesn't read any comments ever yeah. on anything. And I, I kind of resonated with that, but I still, I try it like really here's what it is within the first half an hour. I'm in the comments half an hour to like five minutes, depending on, you know, what's going on in my life. I'm in there like talking to the first couple people and like pinning stuff and like commenting. Yes. No, thank you. You know, people that are being really nice. And it's not that I don't care about people, but I don't think people realize as a creator, how um, all the different opinions of what people think you should do, what you did wrong. It's just, yeah. there's going to be a million people saying, you only have so this. much bandwidth and time to focus on those types of things too. Exactly. And I feel like sometimes now that I'm really doing all this with the skits, YouTube, Instagram, and everything, I feel like I don't even have time to to really even do that because I've got, you know, this schedule, I've got to edit this, I've got to do another skit, I gotta research this, I wanna do the the skill the Silk Road skit, you know. So I love that though. I and like you were saying, some people have higher energy and I, I feel like right now I'm in this, I do think that there's a level of how you feel about what you're doing will give you energy. And I think that also has sure. to do with your ability to not force it to, it, for, to be from a genuine place of this is what I feel like I can help the world with that gives you energy. Like, I don't know if you've experienced that, but if you're like, like for me, yeah, when I absolutely. make these videos, I get the energy from feeling like this is what I'm here to do. You know? Yeah. That's a great feeling. And that's what drives you to want to improve and, and get better at it, to feel the feeling of contribution. You're giving something mm -hmm. to the world. Like it's one of those base human needs that we need. It's like an old thing from Tony Robbins where he talks about you need growth and contribution. Like it's like he has like the six basic human needs and the final two you'll get no matter what – or what, when, you know, I guess m most of the other you'll get like the need for certainty, things like that. You'll get them in negative or positive ways. The last two – and I forget what the first four are, but the last two growth and contribution, a lot of people don't get that, but they're kind of the most important. They're optional in a way, but they are the thing that gives you the juice 
to do what you want to do in life. The feeling that you're growing, getting better, and that you're giving something back. And most people don't have that. Yeah, you want to know what stopped me the most from doing what I'm doing, what I'm going to do is, it was actually a fear I realized recently, like this is a very recent realization. It was a fear that people wouldn't be interested in stories. Really? You know, it's, it sounds so stupid, but I wanted to, (laughs) (laughs) because that's, I was really interested in ancient history and a lot of other things, but I thought that I had this pre disposition that I needed to help the world by practically like, this is how we can help you spiritually or mentally. Yeah, that was like pertaining to daily life, their mm. thought patterns, the ego, these things. And if you look at my content, you can see that. Like I consistently do that. And I think yesterday was a really a big stepping point for me where I'm just like, I think I might really be here to tell stories uh, in a major portion. To help other people with, with their daily stuff too, but it's not being afraid that to feel like I have a gift in presenting information, not just like... Because I think sometimes I got convinced that if I'm not like being uh, here, who are some examples? Kind of like Dr. Joe Dispenza helps people mm-hmm. like in their practical daily yeah. life, or like Eckhart Tolle's up there freaking helping in a, in a specific way, or Muji is helping, you know, with his non dual teachings. And it's like pertaining to people, human suffering. And so I was afraid that storytelling wasn't going to be good enough. It wasn't going to help the world enough. And, but I kept, I was always struggling. Like my content didn't ever do as well when I was doing that stuff fully. I think sometimes yes. And so letting go of that fear and just being like, I just want to tell stories about what reality could be. Like yesterday's video was about alien contact with that told us how to stop reincarnating. That's like indirectly helping somebody. But I thought that that wasn't good enough. And so that's been the biggest realization is that I'm glad you like stories. Because you do have you do have that skill of storytelling. I think it would do you really good to lean in on that, focus Thanks, in on man. telling stories. And yeah, man, you're a funny guy, dude. Focus on the humor <laughs> p- portion of it. That's what I've been trying to do. This next skit I just filmed outside. It's about uh, it'll be out after this comes out, but it's about the sun controlling us, and um, <sighs> that one is. I could have been a little bit more funny. I do realize that, but that's kind of the process. Like yeah. just just filming it and then reflecting. That's the beauty, right? That's what Mr. Beast talks about too. Is like you've got to just reflect and see what you can do better each video. And do so you ever, I'll put that out you, there. Sorry to cut you off. Uh, do you ever, when you yeah. watch your videos, do you ever watch it from different people's perspective? Have you ever watched it and then you watch it and then somebody likes it? that you know, and then you go back and watch it as if you were them. Have you ever done that? No, I haven't. You've never done that? Maybe I'm just a psycho. I don't know. (laughs) I've done that before. (laughs) Like I watch it and somebody likes it. I'm like, oh, I'm going to rewatch it as if I were them. How would they have, how do I think they would have perceived this? I don't know. Maybe that's not a good thing to do. I don't, I don't think I, I almost think I do it to re enjoy it or something. I don't know. Maybe it's a, Mm. It's a little bit of a weird thing, but yeah, I've definitely done that. I, I can't be the only person in the world that's done that. There's got to be other Yeah, people. it's so hard to, another fear, dude, this this brought up something else for me. You're thinking about, like, watching it from other people's perspectives. I think two main things for me was, like, I, I don't want to make videos for other people because then, mm-hmm. like, I know who my target audience is, and they're like me. That's That's how I feel about it. The target uh, some people yeah. are like I my target audience is kids who play video games. Okay, great. My tar- target audiences are just people that are interested in what reality could be. And yeah. you know, that's kind of how I roll with it, but um it it brought up another primal fear that I had that I realized was that I see so much corruption in the world and I was fearful that if I didn't call it out in some way Mm. that I wouldn't be doing enough. Yeah, the old silence is violence thing. Right. And so I also had to come to terms with, if I see something that I think really needs to be talked about, okay. But I I can disconnect from everything else in the world to the point where I can focus in on what I want to do to create. And that's okay. Like, it's okay to specialize. You have to. 
Yeah, and I couldn't. I I tried to I tried to do it without specializing, and it was just information overload, and then you you get just so clouded, like you were saying. So it's like I had to focus in on this is the specific things that I want to do with my life. And it wasn't until that moment where I realized that I don't need to help anyone in any particular way. Just what do I like to do? You know, do you yeah. think about that when you're making content in your life? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think about that for sure, but my interests are all over the place. I really mm -hmm. was thinking earlier when I'm thinking about the podcast and thinking that one, I just want to make sure we have a good organic conversation. Like, so I, I like the style of podcast. I really don't know I would do well on a podcast where it was rigid and structured. But I did sure. think, what do I say if he asked me what I do? I that is that question brings up so many weird feelings because I don't have a good answer for that question. When someone I meet somebody and they're like, "Hey, what do you do?" I'm like, "Fuck, I don't know, man." I do a lot of shit and what I'm doing today <laughs> will probably be different than what I'm doing next week. You know, like I, I'm a writer. I write, I create videos. Sometimes I do some advising. I, I like to find and resell books on eBay. Like I do all kinds of stuff. And, um, yeah, so I definitely think about what I, what, cause I know if I don't, if I don't have an interest in it, it's going to be shitty the content. A lot of times when I make a video, it's, it, it is, I'm reading something like you were saying earlier. And I feel like I've made a connection between two things that maybe other people haven't, or that just seems interesting. And I just go right then and there and make a video. Um, I did hear something one time where it was, somebody gave this piece of advice, which I thought was good. I don't know that I've practiced it, but if you're struggling with the idea of making videos for yourself and making videos for your audience, do one for you and then do one for them. Do one for you and then do one for them. Um, you know, if, if the, if your audience is so disconnected from what you like to do, that's kind of a problem already. They kind of should align anyway. Like you said, your target audience is basically people like you. So that shouldn't be such a disconnect, but sometimes maybe people want to learn something more about something you've talked about and you're like, okay, well they want to know more. So here's, here's what you're asking for. Yeah. I, I definitely think you have to have a passion and a desire to, to talk about what you're talking about. Otherwise it's just going to suck. I don't see how people do it otherwise. Well, they do it for money or yeah. fame or whatever. Yeah. I, I, mean, I just don't think I would even be good at that. I don't know how people do that. I, I have thought before, like, okay, I could do this and make a lot of money. And then I don't know how you sustain interest in something unless you just love money that much, which, you know, money's great. But I, I Some people, could not do something creative. <laughs> they love just going money. on that golf trip. <laughs> do I? They love going to the Bahamas. They yeah. love golfing yeah, that's... out in the middle of the, the Pacific Ocean on a yacht. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess they're Whatever. able to connect what they're doing to, to what that money allows them to do. But I, right. for me, I've never understood how you could be creatively fulfilled, like fulfillment. We talk about goals. My main goal, I just want to wake up every day feeling good and excited about the day. Like that's simple. And, and that's what I want. And I think if you got to the core of what most people want, that's what they want too. They want to feel a vibrancy in their life and an excitement and a joy and, um, a sense of meaning and all of those things. And I think uh, creating things from a place that doesn't resonate with those ideals is a bad road to go down. I mean, you see, and then, then you end up getting exposed for being full of shit anyway. I've seen it time and time again with creators. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, they're not who they say they are. Yeah. I think yeah, we I do have a fulfillment crisis. I mean, it's it's partly because the way that to keep people entertained entertainment usually uh entertainment usually promotes dumb things let's just say that yeah. i mean look at the movies sometimes that were popular in the past i mean but there are some really interesting movies that made it like inception interstellar fucking some of the marvel movies had some really interesting concepts yeah. quantum mania was good doctor strange so every once in a while you know you'll see some movies that'll really get into the collective consciousness of like people's minds I'm like, wow, that might have a deeper meaning. But sometimes it's just friggin' guns and friggin' John Wick. Friggin' bad at it. yeah. I mean, I love me some John Wick. Trust yeah, it's, me, good it's good to have that mindless entertainment sometimes, but I get what you're saying. Right. You sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's, 
uh, you just you see not it's not really in movies. It's more about you know just dumb dances we've seen mm-hmm. that be popular for a while, and I think it just comes down to the end of the day to people feeling like that primal hierarchy of need, we're just wanting to survive, and if they're barely surviving, if they go online and dance they'll make millions especially if they're a woman so yeah. it just it sucks that, that that's the way that the system is but i think if enough of us become conscious of how things are ran and um have some sort of connection to um this inner morality or ethics and some people say that's divinely guided in a religious sense that's not what i'm referring to i'm referring to maybe an in a non uh religion spirit force connection creator thing that we might all be a part of if yeah we, like if we there's just something that, bigger than yourself right yeah, exactly that and that concept, yeah. exactly it is that simple and mm-hmm. the more that we connect to that the more that we can just understand and have a society that's conducive to harmony if more people have that on their mind like that's what they want and that's what they're working towards is harmony within and without yeah and i think that it can be that simple we don't all have to be like spiritual knowledge masters it's just like what is the daily person who's a construction worker how do they see the world Mm -hmm. and and, you know people who build the infrastructure of the the country how are they feeling about their lives and you know because we need that we need the people that are um, able to provide on a physical level as well so we need to make sure everyone kind of has a connection and nobody feels left out, which is why you say it's beautiful communities, finding communities yeah. like jujitsu. It's a, that's a beautiful community. You know, I just realized recently the power of, of community, which is why, you know, part of the Patreon for universe game, it's called, it's literally called universe game on Patreon. Part of that, we have a discord community and I oh, found that to be really powerful. You know, there's just people in there helping each other and it's like, I'm yeah. hands off on some of it. And it's just beautiful how other people are supporting like what you're saying, there's people going through hard shit and there's other people being like, I got you. I like, understand. Like some people don't even have one person that they can lean to and talk, talk to. And so I've been really leaning into the power of community. And I think there's, you know, many communities that someone can be a part of mountain biking community, a Facebook yeah. group. I mean, telegram group, there's so many different things, but having other humans that are like-minded in you in some way, at least in one quality, whether it's a martial art or, you know, wanting to see a bigger picture of the world is valuable. And I feel we don't need to rely on others to feel less lonely, but I feel do feel like it's a primal human need to, or not need, but it's a primal human trait to want to have other humans around and to, to feel a part of something. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, like our environment is so important. That's where I think some of the personal development world and spiritual teaching world gets people. It, I don't want to say it gets it wrong, but for me, it has, it was, it has felt we- weird to hear things like it's all, everything you need is within you now to change your life. And that's true, I guess, on some level. But if you're in a terrible environment, let's say somebody, a child who lives in an abusive home and they have no food and you tell them that tell somebody who's in that situation you have everything within you to change your life now it's like look i don't even have lunch and my dad is beating me how how am i going to change my life i'm 12 years old and i think some of that stuff it doesn't resonate with people because they're in such a survival state where the truth is they do like if they just woke up and drank some water and went outside and got some sun and went for a walk. Just that simple way to start your day of move your body, put some good stuff in it would change how you feel throughout the day. And then you could make those small changes. They'd be surprised at what that would do for their life. Um, But they're so caught up in the drama of their relationship or that they have bills due and they just can't see, you know, the for the forest for the trees. Um, I know that seems like it's oversimplifying things, but I think sometimes as humans, we do uh, over complexify things. I don't know if that's the term. We overcomplicate things very much so. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you 100% on that because it like it goes back to what you're saying at the beginning. You just freaking get some decent food. You get outside. You know, you, you move your body however you think is best for you, whether it's doing boxing freaking jujitsu or 
doing functional patterns or working out at the gym, something to get that feeling and, uh, it'll really benefit you. And people sleep on that because it doesn't, if you think about it, I think that just psychological perception of what is the big difference between me scrolling on my phone for an hour when I wake up mm -hmm. versus going and sitting out in the sun for 25 minutes or 15. Yeah. It doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal, but it is massive. It is and that's massive. the hard part is, is <sighs> the chemical reactions are so unconscious that we don't understand how much that makes us feel different. So your body's ability to align to nature is pivotal. That's why I've always been in, yeah. you know, a proponent of getting outdoors and doing stuff and going hiking. You know, when we were in Virginia together, we were trying to go hiking, but it was so cold. It was just, it was so, it cool. was so cold and rainy and it just didn't work out. But you know, that that's proof. Hey, we, we tried, you know, and sometimes you can't do it. Um, yeah, but you know, it still worked yeah. out. And that's the thing. Yeah, that's the I, real cold exposure. Yeah, man, Literally. it was like the perks of living in the South, you know? Yeah, this, it's, I mean, I'm sweat. It's 100 degrees when I'm filming these skits. Just remember that. But it's sunny. <laughs> so, right. I guess. When did you get back from, weren't you in Hawaii for a while? I was, yeah, for two months. Wow. Yeah. That's probably that why was... you feel so good, too. <laughs> that has <laughs> to have something to do with it. <laughs> Not many people get a chance to be alone for a month and figure out their entire psyche. That's um, awesome, man. Yeah, it was dreary because I was in the rainy season in the rainy part of the mm. island. I was on Big Island. So it was like psychologically um, tough in that respect, but it really made me go within because I couldn't go anywhere because mm. it was raining. And so, yeah, I, I think I figured out a lot about myself through that. And then just the trials of getting back, trying to get back into normal life and then being like, why am I doing this? Like, yeah. this isn't actually what I want. And it's so hard because you're like, I like making vertical content, but it's like, there's another level that I feel like I've always wanted. And it's so hard to reach for that dream. But if you're just start doing it, like, that's what I did. People yeah. think like they were, people have told me like, I work with people one-on-one -on -one, and they're like, I do a lot of, mentorships for people who want to learn how to make content at a high level and people i i find the psycho the psychology a lot of times is very similar at the starting people just don't realize that everyone starts the same that i was once there yeah. now of course there's a lot of benefit from learning from someone who has tried all the bullshit and see what works and what doesn't and who yeah. doesn't for a living yes but sure. at the same time you can get so much value like if you can't afford that, some people can, and I would recommend it. That's what I did. Um, but if you can't afford that, to, I didn't do that at the beginning. For the first two, three years, you know, I blew up without anyone telling me exactly what I needed to do. Um, but that was in a different time period. You know, there's there's just nuances to everything in life. It's just basically you're trading. You're trading time for money. If you have extra money, right. you want to save time, then go you for it. Right. that time period. Yeah, because yeah. you'll do it quicker, for sure. If, if you have somebody who's doing it at a high level, helping you, if you had Mr. Beast telling you how to make videos, bro, like you would do right. good if that was your target Dude, audience. You, you would know? be surprised. Um, I was surprised just to see how one little thing I learned through many times in life has made such a big difference. I started, for example, I started selling on eBay back in like 1999 with my parents wow. we would like go to thrift stores and start to like the jockey lot, which is like a flea market and just a little bit there. And then over the years and when I've needed a little bit of extra money, I've sold. And then I, I really love books. Um, and so much so that I'll collect them and I don't even read all of them. I, there's no way I'm reading all I have books and books and books all in storage. And I was like, well, I should probably sell some. And then I also really like finding old books and, and selling them. And, uh, I was doing everything on eBay. This is just an example of how one piece of advice can change everything. I was doing everything on eBay. Back in the day, you would always sell things as an auction. And I was still doing auctions. And I met a guy who, local guy who was selling $10,000 a month in eBay stuff. And we were just having a conversation and, he, and I was talking about auctions. He was like, why are you doing auctions? You should do buy it now. And so I started doing buy it now instead of auctions 
and my stuff actually started selling. Like I would, I mean, it's like a hundred X how much I was selling. So just that one oh. little thing, like instead of clicking this option, you click this option and you actually sell your shit, you know? And just like people were saying, get on TikTok, And you're like, eh, I don't know. That's a dance. That's for dancing. And then you got on TikTok and you blew up, you know, like those mm-hmm. little moments matter. And you, and it really is good to have people that know what they're talking about. Yeah. That's why I try to surround myself with people that are like-minded to me. You know, you were talking about Bruno and Marco, both of them, people might know Bruno as Indigo Bruno mm. and Marco as we did a podcast before, so you can go watch that, but the better one's going to come out here soon. But, uh, it's, we we filmed two halves, but the second half, you know, the second yeah. half was better. Yeah. I wasn't <laughs> sure. I thought, okay, maybe the audio because of the cars. I didn't know. I thought maybe the audio wasn't good enough, and you weren't going to put it out. No, we're still going to come out. I just haven't taken the ten hours to edit it. Yeah, yet. It's a lot, that's a lot. It's a lot of editing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think I have all the recordings, right? Do you, did you have any of the recordings? No, you did one? everything. No, I didn't have any recordings for the second one. You have everything. Okay. You did it with your camera cool. and a phone, I think. Yeah. So, but yeah, they, they are both like-minded and I, and I, I've tried to reach out and, and try to get in the same circles as people who, like you said, know more, th- like what you're saying about jujitsu, learning more, um, from people who know more than you or who can be better grapplers. Yeah. I don't know if you, know, you call it grappling, correct? Yeah. Grappling. Yeah. Grappling's appropriate. Okay. There it is. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Just make sure I don't want to screw it nah. up. But <sighs> The information that you get from people who are also trying things, like that's why I never really take advice from someone on content that hasn't done at least some level of it themselves, mm-hmm. or they're not in the same arena. Because I don't even think Mr. some of Mr. B's stuff applies. We talked to Mr. B a lot today, so might as well continue. I mean, he's he's. The I guy. feel like some of it applies, but he's also. Film it. You don't want to film your video in the entire style of Mr. Beast because yes, he's going I for agree. eighteen-year-old gamers, right. and yep. so you've got to know like what are people interested in, and how would I film it if I was talking to these types of people? That's why channels like Let's Talk Religion and Esoterica are are like would be considered boring to some because it's just a guy talking about different religions and different things in it, but yet it's massively successful because there's an audience for yeah. that. So. I don't think every piece of advice applies, especially if it's not in your niche. So that's another important thing, too. So there's not a lot of spiritual people who are telling people how to make content on a high level that's not manipulative. Like, sometimes yeah. people are talking about, like, fear-based yeah. marketing and paint and point shit. And you, if you look at my... Whenever I've released stuff, it's just like, this is what I offer. You you can get it or not. It's not like, if you don't get this, your life is going to suck for the next... Oh, man. <laughs> which there's is so what you find. That. It's so bullshit. Yeah, so I try yeah. to stay in integrity because I think that's important. At the end of the day, you asked me if I died tomorrow, how would I would I be okay with it? If I know that I'm not being a piece of shit, <laughs> then yeah. yeah, I feel good. Like I feel like I'm not trying to cheat people. I'm not trying to just make money. I'm actually just genuinely trying to be of service. And so the more that I feel like people can attune their lives to that principle, they would also be surprised that when you give your life, in a sense, at least you you try to serve others in a way that'll help them how much that can make you just feel good about yourself it's like you're living for something yeah. greater than just yourself because at the end of the day nobody's gonna fucking remember who you are who i am we're gonna be the same amount of forgotten like it, i don't care about who knows my name because in 200 years even a thousand years from now nobody's gonna remember nothing the only yeah, thing that, that is gonna leave matter. a legacy thing is weird to me like i don't you know, I don't think yeah, it's, my uh, legacy is in how I impact people. That's it. Yeah. And I don't need to be known for it. I don't care if nobody remembers me, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's, like that. if you're, if you're thinking about, about being known, I feel like that's like, you start doing weird shit. If you're, if you're trying to think about, I want to be remembered forever. Like, I don't know, maybe if you're a great mm-hmm. musician or artist or something, maybe, but, um, yeah, it just doesn't resonate with how, like my energy, I want to put it right here, right now. You know, I want to be, I want to focus on being the best version of who I can be, whatever that means. And, um, I, I don't even have, I don't have the bandwidth to think about what someone's thinking of me a hundred years from now, but it is crazy. <laughs> right. It is crazy. Cause yeah, I say that. And then I start thinking about it. It is crazy to think though, that like your grandchildren, your children and grandchildren will be able to go back. 
Like it would be so cool to go back and watch a video of my grandpa having a conversation with somebody. In fact, when he was 25, right? Like that would be crazy. <laughs> my, my mom actually has recordings of my grandpa that he had conversations. I don't know who, I don't remember who was having a conversation with. I've never listened to them. I don't know why I haven't, but she has recordings of conversations they had, uh, from when he was like 60 or something, which is kind of interesting, but you know, wow. 300 years from now, 500 years from now, my great, 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 great grandkids will be able to come back and watch this conversation if we haven't ended the world in nuclear holocaust by then. Or another ah. younger Dryas and the magnetic poles yeah. shift and we're just fucking fucked. <laughs> and that stuff is so fascinating to me, the idea that we have had multiple cycles of advanced civilization and there are th like like if you think about the pyramids and maybe you made videos on this like the pyramids might actually be some kind of ancient technology that we just don't know really how to access like if somebody found a, a smartphone and they didn't know what it was like they wouldn't really know how to use it they didn't know how to turn it on even maybe we just don't know how to turn the pyramids on Bro, I just did a podcast about scalar light yesterday where you're talking about how the pyramids generate a specific uh, field of energy that you can only get with the shape of a pyramid and that that's scalar light and that that generates scalar light is like the predecessor of electromagnetic frequencies. And so, yes, <laughs> essentially to what you're saying, that the, that's what the law of one also says. The pyramids are power plants of spiral. They call it upward spiraling light that it kind of heals the planet that they actually say the pyramids were placed to heal the planet uh, all around the world. And that, that, that specific shape involves that. So there's, I mean, that's just one piece. There's a lot of other people that say Nikola Tesla knew about the pyramids and he was trying to give us free energy, just like the pyramids were actually free energy in the first place. You know, there's a lot of evidence saying they weren't sort of complicated is at all. That they're lying to us. So what I don't were know, they man. instead? Power plants of some sort. Oh no, but the, the there were no sar and sar our sarcophagus is like a coffin, right? Right. There's people that were trying to promote this idea. From my understanding, that the sarcophaguses were not. You couldn't find any tombs in pyramids. That mm. that actually gotcha. that was that was wrong, and that actually the bury it was not a burial place. It was a oh they buried them elsewhere place. Yeah, they buried them somewhere else, I think. And then that a lot of people say that there's even information out there that the Great Pyramid was like an initiation place for like a net, you know, the the mystery schools or whatever. So that's because of the the light and how it's shaped in the the biggest part of it. And so I have no idea. There's there was definitely some crazy stuff. There's some accounts of some philosophers going in there and like. I think was it was it Napoleon or something like that who went to the Great Pyramid? That, that could be wrong, but there was some big ones that went in there, and then they went out and like they were scared shitless essentially because yeah. of what happened in there. So those are stories I'm going to tell in skip format <laughs> because it's yeah, very man. interesting to me. There's so many stories you know? about stuff like that where some of it something's got to be true. Like there's some of it that right. has to have some nugget that we are missing. Right, and I fucking hate coming on here and being like, this one guy who I don't remember his name, who was this dude. It's yeah, like, I want to remember the whole thing. It's like, it sucks and you can't remember. So, you know, the good part about doing all these skits and stories is that I remember the stories really well after doing, doing yeah. the skits and I could repeat them. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So I that's don't. Good. <laughs> I don't remember them. <laughs> well, hey, if you spend enough time trialing and doing stuff, I don't know, that at least it helps me to remember information when I share it rather than just reading it so yeah yeah because you're reading it and then creating content around it and then expressing it and then it then you kind of like retain it do you do you like actually write out a script when you or do you just freeform it it's it so i couldn't do it freeform fully because it wouldn't be i couldn't get the story i tried i couldn't get the story fully mm -hmm. I, so I have like, I wouldn't call it a full script, but I have like the idea and then yeah. I interpret that idea in my own way. So I know what I'm going to say, but I don't have it like 
I'm not reading it word for word because I don't want to be a robot. Mm-hmm. So it's like I'm yeah, just kind of taking it. the idea and like for this next one, I'm like, well, do we? we you had uh, Alexander Shizetsky who discovered he was the founder of the solar cycles research, and you know he discovered that humans are actually controlled by the sun. So it's like uh, it's not exact, but I feel like that's the beauty of it too. Is I can just talk like a normal human my goal is to make videos like someone's there with me and they feel like they know me like truly like they can Mm -hmm. sit next to me by a campfire versus just being like this guru who's teaching them like i just want to be down to earth and and make it practical and and uh something where people feel like they're connected to versus like a cool studio with all this epic shit it's like no i'm just out in my yard of this airbnb i'll have for another little while and then i'll do them in the next airbnb you know so that's how i feel yeah yeah, I like doing it that way too. Yeah, it feels it feels better, and I mean, it is cool to to sometimes I will say something and then think, oh, I I should say it this way, and then go back and record that little snippet, and just how can I say this so it's more compelling or funnier or resonates better or more clear, say it with more clarity and not just like ramble on. That's that's why I try to do some of my stuff with more like I don't know what you would call them. I'll do like a sentence and then I'll say a sentence instead of just do the whole video all the way through. Cause you can go back mm-hmm. and just re-record and say it better. Yeah. Some people are using exactly. chat GPT to help them with that stuff. I've thought of, I've played around a little bit of like rewrite. I haven't done it with any of my content, but, uh, rewrite this in the voice of Mitch Hedberg or something like that. And, uh, I don't, I don't really know what the ethics are on that either. Like, should you, I've made some AI art, and then when I posted it, I put that it was AI art. But I don't know, like, is it unethical to use something like that and not let people know that's what you're doing? Even if you're not – now, obviously, I think if you are if you were to use AI to write a full article and you copied and pasted that, I feel that would be unethical to do. But if you're using it to, like, help guide your thought process, I don't know. I don't know where the ethics on that lies because you could actually – it's interesting because you, what what I found, it, the, one of the strengths to be about ChatGPT is you can – like my son and I were playing around with this story that he wrote about from the it – was, it was like uh, from the perspective of a zipper. Like this zipper on a jacket that this jacket got discarded and the zipper missed the owner and all this stuff. And so we were, we were like rewrite it from the – perspective of the kid missing the zipper now rewrite it from the perspective of a table in the room watching this story take place and it's just fascinating how it actually tells a good compelling story i don't know man <laughs> that's the it's that's weird what we've got to figure out you know in it's the odd. next couple of years i don't really know what the line is on that and it's interesting that we have technology that can do that for us in the first place and um i think it can be very helpful but then it can also lead to people copying and Mm -hmm. you know not being original which is difficult so trying to find that balance i think is important yeah Um, and then also instead of cultivating your own talents then you're if you you could definitely depend on that as a crutch you know i've seen some people use chat gpt to write all their tweets to write their articles and it's like well you're not developing your abilities as a writer i do think there's a space where it can make you a better writer um you know but if you're just using it to just generate content it's not going to you're not going to get better at what you're doing and then also i worry a little bit about i know some artists have already been impacted by it companies that have free or cheap labor now to create graphics you can just go to mid journey and create it instead of paying an artist to do that and it's cool in a way because if you're a small business maybe you don't have the money to do that like now in 2023 we can afford equipment that's not super expensive and do this it doesn't cost that much money like it would have in 1985 same thing is happening with artistic labor or with uh, copywriting and stories and and graphics and art you can go have that stuff created by AI for zero cost pretty much. So I know it's uh, definitely going to impact the artistic community, but technology just keeps evolving and we ain't stopping it. Hopefully we can stop it somehow. <laughs> you think? You think it's possible? At, at some point. 
I do. Oh, I don't know. I I, th- I do think at some point it's possible, and I do think that there's cosmological events that could happen that are out of okay. our control. That yeah. That okay. um, I think here's what I think. This might sound wild to some people, but we're already this deep in the podcast, and if you made it this far, you're a fucking legend. Okay, <laughs> so I just want to say that. But let's get a little bit deeper. I feel like the sun is conscious, and I feel like the sun has an intelligent plan for the universe, and then the sun actually no has the intelligence to understand that humans will develop ai and it has contingencies mm. i think that that's a thing um that's just my hypothesis i have no evidence of that but i do think that there's a and some people might say it's the plan of god whatever you can call it whatever the hell you want you can't disprove it either so right you know, that's true no, i'm saying you can't disprove that theory so you're you know, what if it is true that's what it people does. don't think about. They just think, oh, it's yeah. bleak and weary because there seems like we have nothing that's going to stop it. And I think the design of the universe is so complex. There's got to be something that knew that this was going to happen or that this was a possibility and that it will take care of itself um, either through us or through a, a external force. Mm-hmm. Or the external force working through us, if you want to say. Or, you know, the sun popping off. Who freaking knows? Yeah, the sun fl- the solar flares. That's insane. No. Just to think about how often those happen and how quickly that could just decimate everything we have if there was one large enough. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's a it's a big nuclear reactor, right? The sun is. Um, not according to Tom Palladino, who I had on yesterday, that said it. That's bullshit. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> I'm a, it's funny you bring that up. I'm a purveyor of bro science. Into- he <laughs> no that's actually the mainstream that's not bro science that's actually okay. <laughs> what the mainstream says that's actually good science according to most people gotcha he says i'm just telling you what he says that the sun is actually full of scalar energy which is um the like i said before it's it comes before electromagnetism kind of on the spectrum and so that means is that if you he said if you go into the center of the sun you would be immortal that it would not harm you at all. And Wouldn't you have just, to be immortal to get to the center of the sun? Unless you figured out a way to have technology to take a spaceship through the violence of the surface <laughs> that's, a, that's a million Earths wide. <laughs> or teleport to the or center Or it's of 70 the sun. miles away, according to the Flat Earthers. I have no fucking idea at this point. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I don't fucking know. It could be either one. That's what, that's what it's supposed to be. A million miles, a million Earths can fit inside the sun. So if you could fucking penetrate that bitch. Yeah, Jesus. Like your mind can't even comprehend that. My son, my son is also I freaking know. out about the concept of eternity. So we've been having a lot of existential conversations and he was like, he said, just to think about eternity, just, it just feels so dark and forever and empty and endless. Like, I guess the eternity, the infinity of space. Yeah. Our brain has limits to what we can comprehend. I guess anything beyond that is kind of scary. Do you feel like you can comprehend eternity? I don't think I can comprehend it logically. I think eternity can be experienced in like a super, super present state. Like when I'm doing jujitsu or super deep in meditation um, and I have, I'm not like thinking consciously, I'm just existing. I feel like that's us getting a glimpse of eternity. At least that's how it feels to me. You know, whether that's right or wrong, like I'm just not thinking about anything and just like this moment, this one moment is what it's the only moment that ever will be is this moment. And that is eternity. And they're like, it's like almost opposite things in a way, because this moment is this one singular moment, but it's also eternity because it's the only thing that will ever be. And there will always only ever be this. Whew. <laughs> Words are really yeah. bad. At, words are like so bad at uh, like words are really incomplete. Like they just don't do a good job of describing things. Like we have we have these clumsy words to describe concepts, but you know that's where I think like all these all the spiritual leaders and all these religions are kind of pointing to the same idea of like 
there's a beingness that we're all trying to aspire to and words are signposts and they're not really the thing you know the ter- the people that confuse the uh map for the territory and like you can't really describe what an apple tastes like you need to go taste it you know the experience is the thing hmm so it's like eternity is how i would experience eternity would just be like if I just stop doing everything and I just close my eyes and it's just there, right? Mm, mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. feeling of awareness. It's like everything else, that's what the Buddha said, right? Everything is impermanence. If everything is impermanence and everything is change, then everything besides that that sensation of being aware will eventually fall away. But... Yeah, you'll have yeah, to yeah. you'll you can have the sense that you're aware that you're aware which is what i feel like we have mm-hmm. but that doesn't have to be that's not fundamental i feel like the fundamental the fundamental is just awareness yeah, just the awareness yeah and then um all structures are impermanent so and everything else all structures are impermanent and everything is a structure aside from that awareness like even the awareness mm-hmm. of the awareness feels like i'm one step away from where i really want to be sometimes if i'm meditating it feels amazing when you get to that place of awareness uh it feels like you're like it's just like ultimate bliss it just feels so good like your brain is being massaged but then as soon as you recognize that it feels good you're like you still are in it a little bit like you're like in this it takes zone you out, though. It takes you out a little bit like you're like a little bit out but then and then you like think oh i want to get back there but you can't get there by wanting to be there oh man that's so that's so true you know, like, yeah, that's and it. It is, a, and it is a practice. I even, um, I, when I did sauna before this podcast, I meditated in there and I was just like, it was so hard to get meditating in the sauna is a little difficult because it is very uncomfortable the last few minutes, but I think that makes it better. You get more out of it, but I do think also do like trying to get something out of meditation, uh, Sometimes that makes them like I'm trying. I'm like I'm trying to achieve a thing, so then I can't achieve it. It's like trying to go to sleep. You know, you know, you got to wake up the next day at five a.m. and you, you're looking at the alarm clock. You're like, okay, if I go to sleep right now, I'll get five hours of sleep. But you can't sleep. And what you really need to do is to not really care about falling asleep, or even maybe even try to stay awake. But and then you'll fall asleep because that's like your brain just does the opposite. But Meditation. Anytime I feel like I'm trying to get to that place, I'm I just I just don't get to it. That's I feel like that's a key to meditation right there. It's like that's what they call Wu Wei in Chinese yeah. philosophy, the effortless action. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what jujitsu that's one of the things another philosophy that is tied to jujitsu is effortless action. Which isn't completely accurate because it depends on who you're training with and what you're trying to do. Like, obviously, you've got to put some level of effort. But once you achieve some level of mastery or proficiency, the action you're taking is almost like effortless where you're not thinking about it and you're just flowing and making connections. And um, it's 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 more like a, an efficient action instead of effortless but it can feel very effortless. Like obviously you are, you're perspiring, you're breathing hard, your muscles are tired, but it feels effortless in the way that you are approaching it and executing it. Um, Which is, I think like that's the connection to creating content or doing anything in life, meditation, whatever it is that aspiring to Wu Wei, the effortless action. If you could find that, that's a pretty blissful place to operate from. And then you're not so tied up in the outcomes and how people are perceiving it. And you create better things and you do, and you end up doing better things. The outcome is better if you don't care about the outcome. And there it is, man. I feel like that's a great place to end it. That's some legendary advice. Oh. I mean, I feel like that's exactly what I aspire to do in my life right now. That's yeah, the exact exactly. thing. Well, so, well, thanks for coming on, man. It was a great yeah, conversation. Man. Um, 
if everyone everyone should go follow you for sure. So I will put your links in the description to everything and um, every, everywhere people can follow you. And I'll let you'll let me know after the show where that is. And, and I know you're on Instagram at least. Um, yeah, I think that it's way people can continue. James K. Crawford on Instagram and TikTok. Okay. But I will send it to you as well. And thank you Great. for having me on. It's a good conversation.